he's the greatest, and uh, I hope that you will enjoy and welcome my dear friend, Joe Rogan, to the Duncan Trussell Family Hour. What a great sound that is, man. What an incredible sound. I'll never forget that one time that you uh, chanted on, on my podcast, man. And you, you had that fucking long, crazy chant. Yeah. That was really, that was really. You're crazy. talking about the, you're, which one are you, I, I, now I have, I have the, the chant that I almost have fully memorized is the first part of the Lotus Sutra Daimoku, which go, you want to hear it? Well, yeah. Yeah. Is that the one where they say it wicked fast and it's yeah. Really crazy? Yeah. Yeah. You want to hear it? You want to yeah, hear yeah, it? Yeah, 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 yeah. He goes. Myo ho ring a yo open panda ni ni jisa sanju samai anjo ni ki go shari atsu shoba chi jin jin mario go che man nange na nyu isa shou man chaki hagashi butsu shou fu no chi shou isha ga butsu jin gana kisen man no kumu shi shou butsu jin go shou butsu mario do ho yam yo shou jin mio shou fu man jo jo jin jin mizo zui ji shou zui shi nange shari atsu go jo ju butsu yu ai shu ju yin en shu ju hi yu ko an gang yo mu shou ho ben endo shu jo ro ri shou jo ko shou isha ha nor ai ho ben chi gen han mi tsuka ai gu so gu shari atsu nor ai chi gen kodai jin an mario mu ge ri mu shou isa en jo ge ra samai jin yu mu sa jo ju isa mu sa Damn it! Right there, I always fuck right there. That's where I, I lose it. Right Damn, there. That's amazing. How much more is left? A ton, man. There's a whole other chapter you got to do. So that's only the first part of it. That's well, yeah, and is that's fifty that percent. That's not even fifty. That's forty percent. Oh my god, that's amazing. It sounds cool though, doesn't it? It's really got a cool like. It's called the Lotus Sutra. That's called the Lotus Sutra. Yeah. I've seen the video. You turned me on to this a long time ago. The videos of those guys doing it online in sync, and it's crazy. Well, because they do the to. guttural, like, yeah. and there's like a hundred of them doing it. So it's really nuts. The sound is intense. Yeah, that it is super psychedelic, and it's weird how it's got this, like, uh, it, it sounds very similar to, I think they're called the Shibobo people. They're the people who do the ayahuasca rituals, and it sounds like a little, it somehow reminds me of their prayers. And it also kind of reminds me of um, a didgeridoo. It's got that oh, same, yeah. that boing, yeah. Wow. yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. That didgeridoo is fucking dope when someone's talking over it. Like one of the coolest things I ever heard was McKenna at like a rave. He was doing this thing at a rave where he was, you know, he had like his usual rap about mushrooms and humankind. And, but he did all of this stuff over some music. And uh, it was a didgeridoo playing in the background while, you know, he has this crazy inflection. Yeah. So his inflection, and you know, mixed with this crazy music. They moved really into awesome. the savannah from, uh, the, I know the one yeah, you're yeah, talking yeah, about, yeah, Stone yeah, Ape. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a yeah. beautiful. I'll see if I can find it and put it on here. What it, is it called again? Do you remember what it's called? That story, the the what the stone that, that performance. No, I don't know. And it's one, and it's something that I actually spent some time looking for because I wanted. It's something that Contact stuck in my head. Contact Jan Irvin. He'll have it. He has everything. I was, you know, within inches of going down to this ayahuasca conference that's happening in South America, and he's going down there. I saw him on Giannis? the flyer. Yeah, I saw him on the flyer. <laughs> Jan's a great guy, but he's crazy. Is he crazy? It's just, it's really weird to communicate with him. You know, he just, he like will regurgitate facts at you without like, like connecting with you. You're not really communicating. Yeah. He's just regurgitating facts sometimes. Like we had him on the podcast. Like I couldn't get him to just have a conversation. He, it had to be like a lecture. You know, it's like the way he, you know, goes into each individual subject is it's so, it's like disseminating information like a robot. But he's a really smart guy. Yeah. It's just, I don't want it to be, I, I try to tell people like when you come on the podcast, just talk to me, man. Tell me, talk to me like a real human being about like, like you do when I hang out with yeah. you. When I hang out with you, you talk to me different than this. Why do you talk when you get on a podcast? Why does it all of a sudden become a lecture? Right. You know, and some people that when they, you know, comic sometimes if they're uncomfortable, it'll be that they'll like they'll be trying really hard to be funny. Throw in those zingers. Yeah, like planned out ones. You know what I mean? It's like yeah, podcasting is a tricky thing, and someone who is an expert on something like Jan is 
unquestionably an expert on psychedelics. Unquestionably. I mean, he's uh, <clears throat> if I had a question on psychedelics to anybody, I would, I would bring it to Jan Irvin. But having him on the podcast was just weird. And it's, it's I, I feel bad. I feel like I shouldn't have... I, I don't know. I shouldn't have tried to steer the conversation in one way or the other. I should have let it be boring. If I thought it was boring, I should have just let it be boring instead of trying to like pump it up and make it more interesting. Well, that's maybe that's the, kind of the same thing. It's it's the tendency humans have to try to take control of the present moment. And yeah. podcasts are best when you're just in the moment and the thing starts yeah, turning. Unfortunately, into he thought I was trying to censor him, and I'm like, you know, that I wasn't wasn't giving the people enough credit. And that's not what it was. It's like he's to, to be someone who's like that sort of a researcher. Sometimes you have to have this almost incredibly droning desire to go over details yeah in a way that a normal person would black out and go stop yeah just stop you, you know you're you're you, do you not understand there's no entertainment value in this conversation right you're you're breaking it down and making it like less the, the, the subject on its own is like really interesting and fascinating but you're somehow or another managing to pound it down into something yeah. lifeless yeah and boring yeah and it's not that I don't want to hear the information. It's just like the way we're going about it here is so hard to listen to. No, that's a very funny thing. What you just said is the way that certain people will become experts at a thing and the thing itself is beautiful, but somehow their portrayal of the thing takes all the life out of it. And, and it reminds me of what priests do. Well, there's people that want to develop a staid sort of an academic approach to things. And they want to be regarded in a very certain and particular way. So they're trying to do things with, in a way that they would consider to be very professional. And, the, and by professional. Yeah. I mean, I think their world is very different than our world. The world of the stand-up comedian is very different than the, the author world, the world of serious, you know, psychedelic researcher. I mean, yeah. that's what, that's what Jan is. I mean, Jan's brilliant. I mean, don't get me wrong. What he does at what he does, he's fucking brilliant. And I like the guy. I just, and, uh, on the podcast, it just didn't work. You know, and I blame myself for a lot of it. Don't blame yourself. I really do. I, I, I should have saw it coming. You know, and it sort of uh, damaged how I interact with him. Oh, that know? sucks. Yeah, yeah. I need to uh, probably talk to him about it in person. Because I think he really just, just doesn't understand where I'm coming from. A lot of people don't know. There's a lot of people that tell you stories, and they're not that fucking interesting. You know those people? Mm -hmm. Not this guy, not Jan, but like I have a friend in my life that will tell me fucking stories like about himself. Yeah. And they're brutal. They're Ear, brutal. Yeah. They're, they're, they're brutal ear beatings. You know, yeah. like somebody can be funny, like Brody, when he talks about himself. Yes. Like Brody's always, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's always, it's funny. Always funny, no matter yeah. what. But well, this guy's not funny. So he's telling me stories about his life. And it's like, Jesus Christ, man. Like, you, you got to realize when you're talking that someone's listening. Well, no, I, I mean, I view those kinds of people as vampires. Like, I see those kind of people as a, a specific type of vampire. Yeah. They use stories to make it so that you can't talk. Yeah. They don't put enough pauses in, so there's no hope of interruption. So you know that when they get going, you know each time they get going, three minutes, four minutes, three minutes, and there might be a micro pause in there to, to like <laughs> to get in and like, to, but but almost not. And and you know what else they often have people like that? What bad breath? You're right. So they're clueless. They're clueless. So they freeze you in a shit conversation, and but they're breathing. I'm checking mine How too. How can you check your breath? Is it even possible? Lick, lick your hand. Ew. <laughs> I think if you lick your hand and smell oh, it. Oh man, my hand. I know where my hand's been. I'm not licking my hand. That's disgusting. <laughs> think of all sick. the doorknobs you touch, all the assholes that have touched doorknobs. No, I, when you understand the root of the problem, dude, you know the root of the problem yeah. is fucking toilet paper. Yeah. Once you understand the toilet paper factor and you really understand what's going on with that, you understand that people are like, if you sneezed shit, like if it came out of your nose, how long would you wash your face? How long would you spend washing your face? You would wash the shit out of your face. For like three hours, you would wash yeah, your you face. You would get in there with a toothbrush, <laughs> you would clean the inside of your nostrils while you were throwing up. 
Thinking of shit inside your nose. You, <laughs> you, <laughs> you pour gasoline on your yeah. face and rubbing alcohol. Meanwhile, yep. every day across America, Americans blast shit out of their ass. <laughs> they take a white tissue. Uh, Do some wipes. Look at the tissue. Oh, it's okay. It's gone. <laughs> Flush it down. And then they go wash their hands for like a second. Yeah. A little bit of soap. We're okay. Shit all and over your hands. And then they're touching doorknobs. Then Lettuce. they're touching, shaking your hand, touching yeah. your your face maybe a friend is happy to see you and grabs your face hey, oh, Joe! just Christ. rubbing shit well, on your Brian was admitting the other day that he scratches his butthole all the time like during the day he just reaches in and scratches his butthole i'm like jesus christ man like through his touching pants? your keyboard and i know you're not getting up and washing your hand after you do that you lazy bitch dude we smoke joints with that guy <laughs> He's got shit on We've his eaten fingers. this shit. We've eaten Damn red meat. <laughs> what have you done to me, Reichel? <laughs> it's disgusting. Maybe he's an alien and he. Oh, he, uh, he's just a silly man. Impregnant. He's a silly he man. He's a, he's, but uh, if you were, if you had any questions about psychedelics, though, I would say go to Jan. Jan, Jan Irvin knows what the fuck is up. He really is a legitimate expert. You know. Yeah. So it, whatever well, you had, that was a question. It's see that I think it's kind of the job of like comedians and performers to distill the information from the experts like that and try to send it out into the world in a way that's a bit more palatable. It's fucking hard for people to be both. It's hard for a like, guy to be like a Neil deGrasse Tyson who is uh, really compelling to listen to and is also this like scientist who has so much knowledge and information. Yeah. I mean, he's so scientific and yet he's still like this really engaging, entertaining uh. sort of character. You know, well, he's an inter- so it's, a, it's a form of entertainer, and yeah. it's it's an incredible form of entertainer. Like Alan Watts, have you ever listened to Alan yeah, Watts? Yeah. He's like that. It's yeah. the same thing, just infinite knowledge yeah. and still compelling and funny. Usually, yeah. they're pretty funny. Yes, yes, usually they are. Yeah, yeah, he's really funny. McKenna he's, was like that. Yeah, in a lot of ways. I think uh, McKenna was more of like this guy this visionary sort of you know futurist type guy who was just like pondering the possibilities you know you know to the utmost i mean that's how i always thought of him i've always thought of him as just i would never say scientific i would i would more instead of saying like how neil degrasse tyson is like spreading science terence would spread like wonder and the idea yeah. of the possibility yeah really make you grasp the enormity of the human condition in comparison to the other life forms. He was like one of the first guys that really like, you know, there's a thought from the time you were a child when you see people and you see animals at the zoo. Oh, we're obviously better than them. They're in fucking cages. Yes. You know, there's this, there's this thought of, of that, that, that feeling where yeah. you feel like there's people and there's animals. My yes. dog sleeps outside. But McKenna put it into a perspective that was so bright and so well articulated that it cemented the idea in my, well, wow, there really has been an incredible change in yeah. a really tiny amount of time yeah. as far as like the world goes, as far as Earth goes. Like, yeah. This fucking human thing just burst out of nowhere yep. like a popcorn, man. Like this is crazy. In a, a short, tiny period of time, they've literally changed everything about the Earth. They've changed the surface of the earth they've created these gigantic stone things that rise almost a mile in the air yeah <laughs> jesus yeah. fucking christ yeah they're changing the earth well they're literally in a couple of hundred thousand years they figured it all out they went from being animals to wearing skins to all of a sudden they were making clothes and all of a sudden they were making houses and all yeah. of a sudden they made the wheel and all of a sudden they made a computer and they and it's just going to keep but it's happening so ridiculously fast yep and McKenna was the first guy he was the first guy to really articulate that and 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 do it in, in a way that made sense and what's re- even more fascinating is according to McKenna that information came from DMT and the mushroom high that's a lot of that he said was coming from his experiences in in those uh, mind states and like one of his talents was going into those mind states and being able to bring back the information in a way that makes sense to other people he was like a translator for the psychedelic state and it's funny that in that place he was getting information not just related to the acceleration in human evolution but to this idea of the strange attractor at the end of history, the organization principle that's drawing us through time towards it. You know about that, right? The strange attractor. Boy, I, um, I, you know, I've tried to figure out how to swallow that one. 
I've tried to like go back and 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 see his thinking, and he might have just what ifed himself into that. You think so? He might have. Here's I what, don't know. Here's what's it's not weird, but there's another person that shares a a, a similar um, idea as McKenna did. He's a Jesuit priest named Taylor de Chardon. I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce his name, but he says that what's happening is we're not going from the past into the future. What's happening is we're being drawn towards this uh, principle that is simultaneously complexifying things and perfectly organizing and harmonizing them. And the closer we get to it, the more complex and harmonious things uh, tend to get. And so he talked about that, calling that the omega point, which is the point where things reach ultimate complexity with simultaneous harmony at the same time. And that results in the next phase of human evolution, which to us, it seems like a wow, but like, and it is a wow. But when you look at what's been happening, you have the exact same thing keeps happening. You have the single celled organism develops a relationship with another single celled organism. They become multicellular organisms over the course of millions of years. And just that in its own right, if you were a single celled organism, and somehow you had the capacity to understand anything, but you're probably an idiot because you were just a cell. And someone came to you and said, listen, guess what? You're going to turn into a being made up of millions of you all perfectly operating in a harmonious way and uh, being self-determined and able to actually like bring thoughts into the universe through creation. That single cell, that fucking thing would think, what the fuck? That's the opposite of what I am right now. There's no, that's in the same way these people are just saying, we're, that hasn't stopped. Right. We're heading towards another level of that organization. And that's the singularity that I think McKenna was yapping about. I think there's a lot of people that aren't even aware of how much biological diversity we have in our own life in our own bodies. I mean, we're, we're not really just all people. And I don't think people really have wrapped their head around that. There's um, a certain amount of like other material that's functioning inside your body. You know, there's a lot of e-, e. coli. There's a lot of healthy bacteria that you take in. A lot of cultures that you take in, like acidophilus yeah. and yogurt and stuff. And like yeah. these are like organisms. Man. Yeah. I mean, these are organisms that are like aiding you all together in this one big unit. It's a coral yeah. reef in there. Yeah, it's not just a person. You know, that idea is silly. Like, no. there's, there's a lot of other shit going on. And a lot of that other shit protects you from stuff. Like, acidophilus, can, one of the reasons why people like it for your immune system is because the acidophilus culture, is, is a, it's a very strong culture. So when it gets to your skin, like, if you come in contact with other things, like other other you know uh, rashes or uh, Reichel's or finger anything anything gross like that that it can be effective in fighting it off. I don't know about E. coli booty bacteria. Ugh. Brian Reichel's chubby fingers. <laughs> it's so yeah. gross. It's so he's bad. Gross. That's when he was bad. telling me that I was like, really, man? That's Come bad. On. You know, I, well, I wash my hands. Meanwhile, you know he doesn't wash. I'll tell you what, man. <laughs> I'll tell you what. If he was my employee and he told me that, I'd make him wear gloves. Oh. I'd say there's a dress code. You got to wear yeah, gloves well, from that's, now on. That's how you have employees that hate you. Uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'd really do that. It's that's, hard as fuck having an employee. I bet. Oh, it's weird. That's weird, huh? It's totally weird. That's a strange situation yeah. to be a boss. Yeah, I don't like being a boss. I don't I don't want to tell anybody what to do ever. But I need someone to do things and he he he's great at doing certain things, you know? And he's ha- happy with like how his his life is. He's a strange guy. He's one of the weirdest guys I've ever met. But he's he, super talented, man. Yeah. Unfortunately, the thing that bums me out the most about Brian is that his uh, his real talent is uh, video editing and he doesn't really do that anymore. You know, his fucking video editing skills were off the charts, man. He would make some brilliant little videos. Yeah. And now you know, to spend time doing like some of these podcasts, you know, like, man, if you were just doing more videos, I think, I, I think if he could, especially now being as we're, we're the podcast, like really popular right now, I yeah. think a lot of people would watch his videos. If he started making really funny videos now, sure, he could make like a serious impact with his videos, but he's like so wrapped up in this podcast empire thing it's an empire yeah and it's a lot of them are springing up all over the place these little networks of podcasts yeah you know? yeah it's interesting isn't it it's fascinating Adam Carolla's got his own thing going on yeah and it's all and it's and it's interesting to me but it, i mean because well i'm a fucking obsessed with it but because it's like uh 
this to me is, you know, McKenna talked about the tachyon particles being blasted backwards from the end of time. Right, right, right. And how those are like as they travel backwards through time from the intense thing that happens at the singularity, wherever they wherever they go, it creates novelty. So the big novelty events are a result of these particles being blasted through time and the way that they affect reality is not by destroying it like bombs do or meteors do, but by causing novelty to happen and i think that podcasts are fucking a tiny tiny little tiny spark of that tachyon particle that right. mckenna was well doing. you don't want to say it's any bigger a spark than that because it feels pretentious that's why you backed off because it's not a tiny spark at all i think it's a huge spark i think if i was a young kid and uh, i got a chance to listen to graham hancock talk for fucking three hours yeah. when you you and i talked to him yeah i mean dude that's some light that was a life-changing fucking conversation that was yeah. a conversation that made me i mean i had read his stuff already so i already knew uh, you know a lot of what he was saying and it, it had already affected me in that way where i i wanted to like reevaluate the whole history of the human race. I'm, yeah. like, I'm like, this guy was showing us some really fucking clear evidence of some shit that was really, really old. 14,000 years ago in the, off the coast of Japan, all that shit. Yeah. We showed those giant monoliths that were so obviously cut and carved. I mean, the, this, these were not natural formations by any stretch of the imagination. There's no fucking way. And that guy was, you know, he, I guarantee you when he was on the podcast and you and I were talking to him, that changed the way a lot of people who are listening to thought about history. It made, it made a lot of people go, maybe there's some shit they don't know. Maybe there's some shit that happened so long ago. Maybe there has been some wipeouts and yeah. then maybe some rebuilds. Maybe that's what Noah's Ark is all about. Yeah. Maybe that's what the Epic of Gilgamesh is all about. And for whatever fucking weird reason, mainstream science, and that's a terrible expression because as soon as you use mainstream science, yeah. you're a fucking quack. Like, you, you, mainstream. Only a kook. <laughs> mainstream science will say. <laughs> but, it's tr but it really is true, true that they don't want to spend too much time investigating the possibility that there were really ancient civilizations that were very advanced advanced and were blasted off the face of the earth yeah. by, by whatever natural cataclysmic disasters whatever whatever happened that 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 caused that caught well first of all uh, how about uh they know where atlantis is now they know where it is off spain they found the concentric rings they're like really, really? positive yes yeah off the coast of spain yeah and um they're they're tying all of this activity to either a tsunami or some sort of a, a you know a shifting of the ice caps yeah. or something that changed the water level that's what Hancock said. Hancock said it's a result of the ice caps yeah. hitting some kind of uh, – it's, it's the cooler effect or something. Yeah. Like the more water melts, the more it generates heat because it acts as a magnifying glass. Yes. And so it would hit this crescendo at some point and just start melting instantly. And the yeah. sea levels would rise. And Hancock said that the more advanced civilizations tend to live next to the sea because yeah. – so they would be the ones that got wiped out first. Yeah, that's right. That's right. He did say that. Yeah. That was a – fascinating conversation man if i was a kid listening to that it would really make me look out the window and go what is to stop all this from getting wiped out yeah nothing and so if there's nothing to stop that from happening again if some huge cataclysmic natural disaster happens meteor meteor super volcano tsunami that literally goes over the entire la and the valley yeah you know that's possible like people don't understand that's absolutely easy for the ocean to do the ocean could do that in a heartbeat. Sure. Just flood the, the, the entire city of Los Angeles 13 feet underwater. Gone. That's easy. Yeah. That would be a no-brainer for the ocean. Nope. That's not even hard. That's like – that's not even – that's before it had its coffee for the yeah, ocean. That's nothing. So – then we look at this incredibly complex civilization that we've created and we go, well, c clearly this is like under some, someone's control and design, right? Yeah. No, it's not. It's individual entities acting as groups, creating cities, creating businesses in the cities, yeah. accelerating things, changing the look of the surface of the earth. Yeah. And it's all of them acting without any organization. There's not like one directive that's moving everybody in a certain direction. This is the reason why we're building so many buildings in this this spot yeah no there's no one guy right everyone's just kind of doing it like crazy fucking bees yes yeah. this, this building and constructing yeah. and we don't really generally know why i don't know if it's terrence's idea that it was you know that it was we were being pulled towards some attractor that seems to me to overcomplicate what it might just be a natural cycle 
It might be a natural cycle of just complexity over and over again, just getting more complex sure. and exponentially changing all the different inventions and all the different things that people become aware of, just exponentially increase the intensity of all the information of everything around them to the point where they're just immersed in knowledge and ability to control matter yeah. to the point where it gets completely crazy and completely out of hand. And it's almost like that's what human innovation and curiosity is for in the first place. Yeah. That's why we were invented on the universe and all this other stuff like creating like fucking anime and using it to make hot rods. All that is is just a, a distraction of the main goal of the human, which, which is, is to conquer matter, to completely conquer matter, yeah. to completely conquer matter in an elemental stage, uh, in an elemental sense to the point where we literally can reconstruct reality. Kurzweil, this, what you're talking about, he says that at one point – Matter itself will be like computer code and swarms of nanobots will be able to reassemble that matter into anything that you want it to be or that they want it to be in the same way you'd rewrite code in a computer. And this is an argument, you know, I when I was doing that show for Comedy Central, I um, got to talk to someone who does, I can't use it, Stanford, and he's a scientist and he works with nanotechnology specifically they're like trying to figure out how to one of the things they're trying to figure out how to do is an interface that can like i don't know capture images going into the optic nerve or something so they want to understand how the the input output of the human brain so if i can record they want to they want to be able to break down the human brain so that they can um trend they want to be able to code someone's brain in other words if I could, it's telepathy essentially. They want to mm -hmm. be able to use. They want to get to the point where you can transmit your thoughts onto a, your iPad. In other words, you could sit there with your friends and be like, "Dude, look at this thing I just thought," and it goes into your iPad and people can see it. <sighs> That'd be fucking incredible, right? <sighs> what a great app! <sighs> that would be the best app ever, man. But Jesus. but I mentioned this idea of nanobots deconstructing reality, and he's like, "Well." He's like, that's a long fucking way away, man, because when you get down to that small level, there's a, like static is just deadly to a nan static would destroy a nanobot. It's like it's like a lightning storm down there all Whoa. the time. You know, it's not an easy place to be. So so it, the idea of that really happening. So you could fuck up a whole army of them with a balloon. Yeah. Just or, rub a balloon on your hair. <laughs> they'd all die. <laughs> they couldn't come near you because of the static. Boom, boom. Yeah, they couldn't come near you. But. But one here's the th what you just said. Here's the thing. So we have two two ch options. McKenna's idea, which I am more attracted to and think is cooler, it's very cool. Is uh, this idea that there's almost like a magnetic super attractor at the end of time that is drawing us from the Big Bang into itself, and the closer things get to it, the more they complexify and the more they organize. And your idea is more of a, is the idea that it's kind of like a Big Bang theory, that something hit the earth and it was a random event, perhaps. Do you think it was a random event? What, that human life was created? Yeah. Um, I don't think anything is random. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of possibilities. And I think that the uh, uh, in incredible number of possibilities, when you think about the incredible number of planets that exist, I don't think it's random. I think it's one of the things that happens. It doesn't happen on all the planets, but I think it's one of the things that happens. I think it's a part of how the universe works. I think if you get gravity like we have, and if you get air like we have, and yeah. if you get water like we have, and an atmosphere like we have, you get life. You know, I don't understand it. I don't know why. I don't well, know what that, it is. Why? But. That's why I love this attractor principle, because that why... Because it's it's to me like science will science is really good at showing you how stuff works, but it can't show you why stuff works. And to me, when I think about well, you, that, I mean, of course it can. They can they can prove why stuff works. But, I know. mean, like the big why. In okay. other words, like all the know, way I'm, to I'm the end. The why big big why? You know, subatomic particles. Maybe it's, there's no right. answer. But okay. if so, but I don't it, know if that's necessarily true. I think there's no answer yet. I think I think what 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 science does do is they're already at the impossible. They've already stepped back and said like this is mainstream hardcore science. They've said, "Oh, well when you get down to it, what's really going on is the universe is mostly made out of nothing <laughs> and 
it all came from a tiny little spot, and we have no idea why. Yeah. So, I mean, just what they're throwing at you is crazier than any fucking magic trick anyone has ever even thought of doing. Sure. What they did, they're saying that science is saying that the universe was a tiny dot, smaller than the head of a pin, and it expanded in one gigantic event to create hundreds of billions of galaxies. They're yeah. just asking you to believe that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's fucking unbelievable. Yeah. So at the, at the end of science, the last question, how did it all begin? It's magic. Yeah. At the end of science is magic. Yeah. What, they're, what they're saying is, look, we don't know why. <laughs> we don't know how this could even be true. We've done a bunch of math. And what we think is that at one point in time, the whole thing was smaller than the head of a pen. And it exploded yeah. in a magical moment yeah. to create to create our our galaxy, to create our planet. That's the kind of thing where if like one of your kids, if no one knew that, and yeah. one of your kids came into the living room and was like, "Daddy, I, you know everything came from a head of a pen and exploded into all," you'd be like, "That's so well, cute." Well, how about when they tell you that you are made out of stardust? You yeah. wrap, you have to wrap your head around that. The only reason why carbon life forms can exist is because a fucking star exploded. Yeah, like we don't I mean. We can't wrap our head around that. I know we can't. I can't. I can't. I'm just. I'm just. That's word f- soup just tumbling out of my mouth. I don't even know what it me- I don't even know what it means. I can't wrap my head around the fucking sun. Whenever I see the videos of the Earth going in front of the sun, and you see the Earth is this tiny, tiny, tiny little thing right next to that giant fucking Dude, fire. Did you see what was going on this past week? Well, there's there's this appendage to the sun. There's this thing that they've taken all these photos of. Yeah, I don't I've know seen what the, the fuck it, it is. Looks like an umbilical cord. Here's, here's what's hilarious about it. They're all going, "Oh my god, what is this? What is this? This is incredible. This is amazing. Like, what is this? What is this?" And I'm like, "Why are you looking at a zit on the fucking <laughs> sun?" You want to talk about amazing? How about something that's a billion times bigger than the Earth, and it's a ball of fire, and it's just floating through the fucking space, and without it, we wouldn't live. How about that? You can't even leave your fucking house if it didn't exist, because everything would be frozen. How about that? You're looking yeah. at this little thing floating around on top of this fucking immense globe of flame. Yeah. Like, and if you were a kid and you were creating a superhero comic book style rendition of the universe, if you had, you had invent how the how the uh, solar system was really crafted, yeah. you would come up with that. Sure. It's like something a little boy would come up yeah. with. A big ball of fire <laughs> keeps everybody warm. <laughs> I mean, it's so fucking stupid. Awesome. A big ball of fire? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Why does it stay lit? What's yeah. going on here? Yeah. I'm looking up there. There's 17 mile high spikes of flames. <laughs> it's spinning around. It's yeah. fucking enormous. If you look at the size yeah. of the sun compared to the earth, I don't know what the exact dimensions are, but we are fucking incredibly tiny. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's something when I get particularly high on a hot oh. summer day, when I start thinking, this heat is coming from a Jesus fucking star. Fucking this heat is hitting me from a and star. How scary is it when you live in a place like, you know, you live live on the East Coast where there's a drastic difference. Like right now, we, we, we're so lucky in California that we have this crazy temperate weather. Yeah. It's pretty much the same the year best. round. But when you live in a place like Boston or something like that, you become keenly aware that subtle movements in where the earth is yeah. in relationship to the, t- the sun make a big fucking difference right. in whether or not you can even live there. Yeah. You can. The, the only reason why people live in Boston is because winter only lasts for four or five months. Right. Because if winter was all year, there'd be no one living in Boston. So they concede the shit months. Yeah. They concede. They'll give you most of November, December, January. No, yeah, of course it's winter. February, yep, it's winter. March, all right, it's getting better. So they're going to concede at least four months. Four months yep. to suck. Sure. And there, I mean, that's some other places is a lot longer. That's yeah. permanent, yeah. man. Yeah. But I want to get back to something you said right before that, which is that how tiny little shifts change everything. Yeah. Tiny little shifts. And that sun... That shit is not all, maybe it's not always just going to act like that. Maybe it's going to get a little hotter. <laughs> just a little hotter. You know what I mean? A little <sighs> hotter and that's it. Good night humans. Good night earth. Good night nature. It's done. The sun got a little bit more hot. And all this time when you could have been romping around the fucking garden of Eden, fucking hot 
girls and eating <laughs> steaks and living a beautiful life. You were worried about pilot season. Oh, 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 my book is sick, girl. <laughs> Are you serious? Think of that, man. Well, Think that's the that. obsession. The, the acting obsession is just the most ego gratifying, the most egocentric it's obsession. The most, it's vile. That's I why it's so it. repulsive to be around them. You know, the, the difference between, I mean, there's, some of them are really cool. Don't some get me wrong. I've met a lot of really cool actors. Sure, we're, sure. We're, we're massively generalizing. But the difference between them and comedians is that comedians are thinking about shit and they're coming up with their own stuff. Yeah. It's really what you do represents on stage what you're really thinking about. The yep. same as me and same as Ari and all of us. This is all stuff that we're really thinking about. Yeah. yeah, it's true, man. But you know, it's like the 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 problem with. I mean, pi- this is something I've been thinking about is is what pilot season represents. It's not pilot. I mean, pilot season. What the net? What the network system represents, or the system of a massive amount of actors having to audition for a small amount of roles. It's the supply and demand thing that invites exploitation. Because whenever there's only a few roles and there's a lot of people who want it, you get to be an asshole. You get to be this like uh, tyrant. casting couch. You dude. get to be a tyrant or a casting couch dude. But it turns into something. I mean, I don't know how much casting couch stuff happens. I'm sure it happens. I know it happens. But it it's not just that it's wherever you get the pyramid type of power where you have this one thing at the top that's controlling all these things desperately getting at it, going to it it creates the most vampiric forms of business and so these fucking actors they have their par- here's the paradigm of the actor at pilot season here's the paradigm if i don't book a pilot something's wrong with me Something's wrong with me. So what you've done then is you've given all your power over to this network, this fucking crazy network that's only making money because they sell antidepressants and fucking Toyotas. You know what I'm saying? So this is this is not like you're trying to get into some grand museum. It's not like you're trying to get into some into the Louvre with your exhibit. You're trying to be a clothes hanger for words so they can sell pills to senior citizens. That's it. And that's who the actor has hung all the fucking power on. That's who they're afraid of. That's the people they're going to be nice to if they see them at a party. They're going to treat them really good and treat them different because they want to network their way into a sitcom or a drama. It's a disgusting situation, man. It really is. A- I knew a lady who was a casting lady. Yeah. And she would like get guys on sitcoms, but then she would like like fool around with these guys and she was oh is she a still very is she a very still work- manly woman is she still working i have no idea so i won't say her name i'll go visit her i won't say her name i want to get on a sitcom i'd fuck a manly woman to Dude, get on a sitcom. she she like she had a friend of mine in her car and she was like you know let's uh just take a quick st- uh quick trip and go home to my place real quick just fool around a little oh i'm just kidding that's what they we, could. Just, we could. We yeah. could. We could just take a quick trip. I mean, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Don't get crazy. And he's like, ha, 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 ha. He's like, he, she was. She reminded me of. Um, did you remember uh, the Yellow Submarine, the Nowhere Man? He's a real nowhere yeah. man. If that was a female, it would look like this lady. Oh Jesus Christ! Yeah, but dude. she was in a position of power, and she would like, she'd like to get fucked up and yeah. and show up at all these events and like you know bring these little actor boys with her. That is so fucked up, man. Dude, she was pimping it. I I, I I'm much respect, but it was a problem. Yeah, so I I can't really talk about it in detail, but I want to hear. I've more. seen I've seen issues. Well, it's a, that's a inevitably the result when people decide to worship idols. Is you're gonna have to you're gonna end up getting an, some idol dick in your asshole. I think she actually wound up getting caught um, hiring the wrong person for something because she uh, the, the the producers had wanted one person and she decided to sneak this guy in oh because she was my banging God. him. I didn't even she know she sent him to the much. set. I I didn't even, I didn't even know they could do. Uh, that's oh yeah yeah yeah. She she got caught. She got caught well, because uh, the, one of the stars was actually. It turns out that the guy that they were supposed to hire was actually a friend of one of the actors, and she didn't know that, so she tried to just fuck him over. It's the worst, man. This is why I love podcasts so much, and this is why I love what podcasts represent, and this is why I fucking love what. Uh, Aziz Ansari and Gaffigan and fucking Louis C.K. are doing because every time somebody does something like that and re- and removes the programming or brings the programming completely in the control mm-hmm. of the artist, then you have done something novel and new that yeah. people 
people aren't people aren't used to that. I think no. that's why people <clears throat> like podcasts so much. Oh, for sure. Yeah, podcasts. It, it's it's beautiful that there's. I was thinking about this today. I was like, if if we had, and we we even have talked about it on our podcast jokingly the other day. I was saying, could you imagine if all of a sudden we got bought by somebody and that we got a producer? Just like, yeah, we're gonna just make it easier for you. You don't have to worry mm. about anything. <laughs> we're just gonna handle everything. We'll we'll handle all the sound and just show up, and everything's yeah. perfect and professional. Okay. Um, but, um, uh, if you get a little too loud, I'll just be in your ear. I'll just tell you about, you know, maybe take it down a notch or yeah. maybe that's not a subject we want to go down. Mm-hmm. Can you well, imagine you know, if all of a sudden had, that, that is like the epitome of hell. Like what if all of a sudden, uh, I'm my, my podcast is doing really well and, uh, you know, uh, some media conglomerate wants to come along and buy it and, and put it on television. And then all of a sudden there's a, a producer in the room. Yeah. And then there's, listen, man, uh, I, I came here to work with you. Okay. But there's going to have to be some compromise. Okay? Okay? I mean, uh, I have my own vision of how this thing should be to make a really great television show, and that's what I do best. Yeah. And I know how to do it. And that's why they pick me. And rape jokes are not the way to do that. It's not funny. It's not This good. guy with, with talking about digging into his asshole? Really? We can't you, have that. You can't do that. Yeah. They, they would can't. immediately... That would be we the can't, hell. You no, know, he'd be like, I'm sorry, we can't use the term red ban. Actually, that we're not allowed to use that term. That's a copyrighted term. used by said, red ban would have to change his name. You'd have- oh, my God. We call him the the gimp. Yeah. <laughs> that's, what, that's what he is. When <laughs> That's what Tate used to call him. Tate started off calling him, where's the gimp? <laughs> the gimp. Well, it gets, it's. It- oh, no, it was Joey Diaz. Joey Diaz was first. The gimp. Where's the gimp? Where is he? What you doing with him? It's just this fucking tendency in those types of conglomerates to send a person like that in and start just picking pit, apart, shitting in the well, shitting yeah. in the well. And so that and so when people whenever whatever you're watching on TV, whatever the thing is, even the best thing that you're watching, whatever the show is that you like a lot, whatever that show is, I promise you that somewhere along the line of that show being made, there was about seven assholes who tried to ruin it guaranteed who gave bad notes or wanted to transform it into something else and if it's a good show then the creator you know if you're watching a good show that the creator went into a bloody awful war with probably seven people (laughs) to get that made a lot of arguments a lot of slamming down the phones a lot of being like fuck it i just won't do the show then (laughs) a lot of that a lot of that if the show is good if the show is bad Guaranteed, this is what there was a lot of. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Those are great notes, Jim. <laughs> we'll totally do it. Yeah, when it's like South Park. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you, 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 for it to get to be like South Park, for it to get it, for it to get to be like the, um, Louis C.K. show. No yeah, notes. Yeah. No notes. That's it's, beautiful. It's good because there's no notes. Or like, I'm sure fucking curb your enthusiasm. No one's going to give Larry David any notes. No one's going to like tell him <laughs> what to do. So the shit yeah, comes well, out you really know, good. That's a beautiful thing that Louis is so respected that they know that he'll put forth a, a good a, a good product. Like they, they entrust the entire product in his hands. Well, that's no, really amazing. He told them, he told them, I'm taking less money. And you can't give me notes. That's the story he says. Is he wow. took less money so that he didn't have notes because he didn't need the money. He said I love it. he didn't. Need, I it, love it. Yeah, it's so, so awesome. But the re- irony in that is they're like, okay, well, if we don't get to give you notes, there's a greater risk for us, so we can't pay you as much. The irony is, if the they had been able to give notes, the show would suck. It probably wouldn't be on the air anymore. Right. That's the irony, man. Right, That's what's right, weird right, about it. Right. They should be paying him more money <laughs> to not take notes. Well, you would say that, but for, it's not true for everybody. For a guy like Louie, I would say absolutely. You know, there's certain guys who you just can totally count on their work ethic. And Louie's yeah. one of those guys. Just, oh, yeah. just totally count on his work ethic. Totally. I mean, well, yeah, he's like, well, he's one of the... Yeah, he's, he's a machine. He's a machine. Yeah. And, and And he's a generous machine. But I wouldn't give that, like, to Norm MacDonald. No. No. Norm MacDonald? Yeah. Norm oh, MacDonald's hilarious. About. Yeah, yeah, no, He's I'm fucking sorry. brilliant. I was thinking of the guy who hosts. Yeah, you know. I know. I was thinking of the guy yeah. who hosts The Price is Right now. We were on the fucking plane with Norm MacDonald. Norm MacDonald, first of all, is awesome. So all of a sudden, yeah. I, this twice this has happened. I've been on a plane with him. Just, just total dumb luck. Weird. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, but uh, one of them, I sat right next to him. He's a fucking character, man. He's so fun. He's just such a fun guy, man. And he was talking about, yeah, quit smoking. Uh, it's just, uh, 
bad for you, you know? And I just I had enough. <laughs> and so I haven't smoked in a while. And he lands, we had this crazy talk. He lands at the airport. He goes, yeah, I'm going to go fucking smoke. And he goes and goes to the store and buys like two cartons of cigarettes. He's <laughs> lighting them before he even gets out the door. He just starts smoking. Jesus. Just like that. Boom. It's like hilarious. For no reason. I don't know what caused him to snap over to the dark side. I don't think I gave him any pot or anything. I don't he got think. triggered. I wish I remember if I gave him pot because I know if I had some, he would take it. Oh, that would have definitely done. Oh, my God. Dude, I think we just got abducted by UFOs. Yeah. I think we just got brought back to this moment. <laughs> it's just a weird thing was happening, man. It's like we were talking and all of a sudden I felt like the world hiccup and then we're back. And my clock got... says <laughs> that 10 minutes have gone by, bro. That's nuts. It's fucking weird, man. I have no idea what happened. <laughs> Ari so. told me he did uh, salvia once and he said he had months of life. He said he had relationships with people. He was living with them in yeah. their community. They were all together in some crazy like cloud world. And all of a sudden, boom, he was ripped out of that and brought back to the podcast room. And he said it all happened within the course of five to ten minutes. He lived months and months in another dimension. Wow. And he goes, it's crazy. He goes, I, I, I remember the people. I remember the relationships. He goes, I was there for months. Months. Yeah. Imagine if that's real. I mean, we say it's not. We say it's ridiculous. Magic can't really be real. But what if it really is? What if when you smoke salvia, you really can? If you just tap into the right frequency, what if salvia is like, uh, what, what is that one website where you just uh, stumble upon? What, yeah. if, what if salvia is like stumble upon for the fucking dimensions of the universe? <laughs> yeah. And you just click into one of them yeah. and boom, you're living with cloud people. Sure. And you're, you're having relationships with them. You're yeah. there for months. And you think this is the new reality. And then you you get brought back, and in, re in the real reality, only ten minutes have gone by. Well, yeah, this is in the this is in all like the Vedas. They talk about this. They call it the um, um, high, they have a weird, a primitive name for it. The higher planets is what they call it, and and what they and so it's all these different like. So the idea is they have this. It's what's really cool in India is that they break everything. They try to break. They try to break everything down as much as they can. They try to like put it into a like put a fucking map on top of it. So they have this for types of breathing and for your very thought patterns and the makeup of what you are. And it, it's really detailed. And the the amount of detail that is applied to it helps you begin to differentiate from your personality and kind of merge back into the universal whole, which is like the whole goal of this stuff. But they talk about how there are these, the pleasure on earth, all the most pleasure that you can have on earth is like one six millionth of the type of pleasure that you would experience in each of these like higher dimensions that you can go to. Now, this is clearly coming from like a very primitive society and uh, whether or not they're, they're, they're primitive, I don't know if I'd call them primitive, but an older society that had a different language system and a different understanding of the universe. But I kind of know what they mean, which is that the more you get healthy, even in this on this planet, the more you get healthy, the more you take care of the, yourself, the more you meditate, the more you begin to expand your consciousness, the more pleasure you begin to experience. Yeah, you, you definitely. So, it's, and, but the types of pleasures that you begin to like when you get to that state, it's stuff some people would hate. You know what I'm saying? Did I just lose you? No, you didn't lose me at all. Like, what do you mean by the type of th things that somebody, some people would hate? Like, in what way? Well, like, for example, the experience of fucking, like, like, before, like, not that long ago, I was super fucking depressed, right? And <clears throat> I remember laying on a mattress on the floor of a basement, staring around at my filthy fucking living space that I was living in, just really depressed, man. And, like, if I thought about running, you know, getting up in the morning and, like, running for an hour... It would seem awful. It would just be like, oh, I'm not going to do that. That sounds terrible. That is, I don't want to do that. Or if I thought of like getting up really early in the morning, that would sound terrible because I was depressed. I didn't want to do anything. A quality of being depressed is you don't want to do anything. You get, you get. There's a increased gravity to to the to to the earth, and you just want to lay down and not move. This is called the mode of ignorance. Is what it's called in the. In Hinduism, it's the there's three modes: ignorance, passion, and goodness. But the lowest one is ignorance. A lot of people are living in that state. So that's what I mean. When you start moving out of that place and you stop being depressed and you start like 
fixing your life up a little bit, the shit that when you were depressed seemed awful, when you are feeling better is good. Though it's compared to jaundice. Jaundice makes sweet things taste sour and sour things taste sweet. So the mode of ignorance, things that are really bad for you see, become attractive and things that are really good for you become repellent. And so Whoa. it pushes you deeper and deeper into that space, which is why you got to fucking fight for your life. You got to fight for your life if you're stuck on that, if you're stuck in that place. Isn't it funny how many creative people are also self-destructive? Y yeah. It's terrible. It's weird, right? It's terrible, man. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's an, well, it's, I mean, it's because I think it's because they confuse their creativity with destruction. Uh -huh. They, you know what I mean? Like they think that the only way they can be really, really be creative if they're like miserable. I know a lot of people like that. They, 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 you know, like a, it's entire genres of music are based on this. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a funny, um, it's a funny idea, isn't it? Yeah, the only way to be really creative is to be miserable. <laughs> it's the worst. It's the worst idea. It's strange, though. There's fucking something to it. I don't know what it is. I don't believe it. You know, I, I think I've been more creative over the last few years than ever. And I'm definitely happier than I've ever been. But you're you doing... Know? Here's something I wanted to talk to you about. Because this is something that um, I've noticed that you do. And that I have tried to adopt as much as i can you're the most generous person i've ever met in my fucking life man you have got <laughs> as you like all of your friends all of you you all of your friends you have like instead of trying to suppress them or try to, instead of trying to push them down or instead of keeping them under you you've like elevated all of us to this crazy place and you do that in out of a pure intentionality you do that out of this like insane positivity that you're blasting out into the universe and i think that 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 act that activity is the way to become super creative not from being depressed or miserable but from becoming selfless you know what i'm saying i i i, I understand what you're saying yeah well uh, you know i don't look at it the way you look you you look at it obviously um the way i i look at it like in helping my friends like and, and pumping everybody up and helping them like you know get recognized as comedians, my help wouldn't mean anything if they weren't funny. And all I'm doing is just using my influence and using my ability to book you guys in gigs to 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 help people realize how funny you are. I mean, you're you talent. Are being modest. Now I'll tell you this: there are a few people on this planet that I can call with really good news or something cool that's happened, and they get like authentically excited about it. I guess my mom, I can call my mom and she'll get excited, but you call some comedians and something great's happened to you and they'll be like, oh, great, man. Great, great, great. But inside they're mm. scared and they feel bad. You know, they, it, it like, it really yeah. disrupts some people. Um, a, a lot of people get really weirdly competitive and upset if some great thing, but if any fucking awesome thing happens to me and I call you, you get as excited as I get. Yeah, that's crazy, man. That's <laughs> crazy. It's like it's something that um. so it's more than just, yeah, you guys are already funny. So I'm just sort of it's more of an intentionality. And it's also well, something your your comedy and you and your think your thinking not interrupt you, but it helps me. It helps me. You know, it's not like a one way street. It's not like, you know, you and Ari and Joey don't constantly make me laugh. Right. That all pumps us all up, man. It doesn't just pump me up. You know, or it doesn't just pump you up. It pumps us all up. When you guys are making me laugh, like that that's like the, the best thing I could ever ask for. You know, and, yeah. and I'm around you guys all the time, I'm always laughing. You know, that's that's all like super positive. That's not easy to do. You know, it's what's difficult is associating that with everybody else, getting other people involved somehow or another with some some form of marketing, some some way to introduce the it's like the, the what makes you funny is almost diametrically opposed to what makes you a good marketer. Yeah. You know, it's like they're so completely different that sometimes what it's your responsibility to do if you have people that pay attention to you like I do, it's my responsibility to point out good stuff. Right. I mean, that's what you're supposed to do. Sure. Like, there's this band, Honey Honey. Did you see the podcast? That I missed did with that them? one. 
it's fucking brilliant, man. This woman has an incredible voice. I mean, it's like a one of a life, one in a lifetime voice. She's amazing. It's wow. like really good. And yeah. together as a band, they're really fucking good. Well, we had them on the podcast, and I pumped them up on Twitter. They're fucking. They went to number three on iTunes. To yeah, their singer in the singer songwriter. Yeah, I heard like, you mention that. <clears throat> yeah. It's incredible. And they, you know, they got their Twitter fucking numbers tripled and all these people from our shows uh, from uh, that are podcast fan, podcast fans have come out to their live shows yeah. and like are talking to them about it after the show. So they're like f- people that found out about it from from my podcast. And to me that's like the best thing you could ever do. Like f- for yourself, like for me, I get excited if I could help somebody else. You know, I get I love it, you know. If I could if if it's like <clears throat> When all of a sudden Ari is like headlining Cap City Comedy Club, like yeah. that's where I headline, man. Yeah. Ari is fucking nailing it, man. I get excited, man. That makes me feel really good, you know, like for real, really good. I, I don't, you know, I don't understand people that don't want other people to be successful as well. They they're, exist. They're weak. That's the, but that they're not going to be successful themselves. They don't understand. And if that. they are, if they are, they're not going to be emotionally successful. They're missing out. You're supposed to be happy. Because your friends are happy. Like, that makes you happy. You shouldn't be in competition with them. The only competition I have with my friends is if we're playing a fucking game or something. Or if I look at it in terms of motivation. Not a competition, but motivation. Yeah. Seeing someone who's doing a lot of work and a lot of good stuff, it makes me have more energy to try to keep up. But never to compete, like, judge myself. by. We're all fucking different, man. Stop all that. That's all stupid. And to think that somehow or another, if some person gets something that takes something away yeah. from you there's more jobs there's more gigs there's more comedy there's more there's enough comedy for all of us there's enough people who love comedy for all of us right there's, it's stupid to be greedy but it, i i want to extrapolate that not just comedy i want to extrapolate from that this dynamic that you're talking about where a group of friends has become competitive or toxic or poison yeah. poisonous <clears throat> this i think is across the entire country this is what i think i think this is happening everywhere and i think there's the counterintuitive um thing that you can do if you and this is something i'm speaking of from personal experience the moment i got undepressed decided i'm not going to be a selfish cunt anymore decided i'm going to fucking work really hard and try to be positive and not like let myself get stuck in like um a fugue state and and be a, a, a rancid miserable asshole even though i might not have seemed like that to other people i wasn't exerting myself enough the moment i did that all of a sudden everything in my life changed and it wasn't changing because i was trying to take more it was trying it was changing because i was trying to give more right and but when you're when you're broke man when you don't have much money you get so scared that you st- don't want to give anymore you don't want to give out to the world you're always trying to protect this tiny little stack of money that you have right. because you because you you feel like your survival's based on it so there's this weird initial leap of faith you've got to take where you're like fuck it if the money goes away it goes away but from now on i'm focusing on just helping the people around me and when you make that leap of faith that's when the money starts coming it's the weirdest fucking thing ever you you probably don't realize this because since you were 13 you've been flying around in private jets <laughs> but for some of us <laughs> some of us it wasn't some of us are just figuring this out now you know well, I got very lucky. I, I didn't figure it out until I'd already been m- much more fortunate than I should have been. I was very lucky. You know, my, my current success, you know, I can kind of attribute at, at a certain point in time to, you know, actually being a, a, a good comic and, you know, being a good mixed martial arts commentator and really having passion for those things and, and for, for doing those things, both of them, really. But in the beginning, it was just stumbling on lucky thing after lucky thing. It's all just luck, you know? So much of it has been luck. So that luck made me, like, super appreciative because my my inability to just accept things for how they seem and the constant sort of deconstruction of the world around me, which is what I've always done. I've never been able to just listen to someone's opinion on something without going over it with a fine tooth comb on on any, any aspect of life. And that makes me do the same thing for myself. You know, it makes me, uh, it makes me do it with everything. It makes me do it as a, as a person. It makes me do it as a comic, you know? And, um, 
I think the weakest thing that you could ever be is to be stingy. The weakest thing you could ever be is to be selfish. You know, when you hear about people that don't want their friends to be successful or they, you know, I've heard of people that, you know, there was a, this one guy who was a bad guy who we know who, uh, his friend was headlining for the first time. So he goes on right in front of him and does an hour, like yeah. unannounced yeah. crushes yeah. sets. And it's one of the guy, the guy was his friend, by the way, was a huge star on television and everything. Yeah. You know, there's, there's things that people do where they want everyone around them to stay down. Yes. They don't want them to rise up. That's it. These are the vampires. I call them, they're the vampires. These are the vampires. Yeah. They've infected society and they, um, and I, I, I don't think every, anyone's really even fully aware of like the impact that they're having on the world because it seems like in a way, yeah, it's just my shitty friend, whatever, you know, sometimes no. he's a jerk to me, but it's really bad. It's like it's a terrible. form of cancer. It's not necessary that you should never allow someone in your life that's going to shit on you. Don't allow someone in your life that doesn't really appreciate you. I had some real problems when I first became successful. When I first got on television, I, I had to cut a few friends loose. A few friends that uh, I had made uh, in, the, in the old days who all of a sudden got this crazy, almost aggressive attitude towards me. They were mad. Like one of them was, uh, he was used to be in a band and he was sort of semi, did stand up here and there. <clears throat> but always really, really wanted to be famous. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm on television in Los Angeles and he just became really super cunty to me, man. Like it was, it was really weird, like aggressively trying to let me know that he wasn't impressed. And I was like, man, I don't know what happened. But I thought we were friends. Like, what the fuck are you doing? Stupid. Yeah. And I wound up kicking him out of my life. I go, dude, you're acting like an asshole. I go, I have, I've done nothing but do good in my life. I go, I didn't do anything bad to you. And all of a sudden, you're, you're acting like I'm some fucking prima donna. Am I supposed to not enjoy this? Like, what, yeah. is, what is going on? I'm not bragging about anything. Yeah. I'm not sticking it in anybody's face. Am I supposed to be sad that I'm yeah. on television because it makes you feel weird? That's it. You know? Oh, it was the, I, had to, I had to cut him loose. And he was a good friend up until that point. That's, I, that's a gauge. That's a way that you could mark your fucking... Uh, the people you're with is if you're talking to them and you get afraid to talk about good news with them because you know it upsets them. Yeah. There are people like that where you're like, start talking about some great thing and then you have to moderate it because yeah. they're like, oh no, this is this hurts them. Yeah. To hear this. Oh God, it's the worst. It's the worst, and it's it's, it's not a real friendship. It's a plague. Yeah. It's a it's fucking terrible. plague. Yeah. It's terrible. Well, I think the best friendships are the friendships like. I enjoy our conversations immensely. And one of the reasons why I enjoy them is because I always consider your opinion and your analysis and your, you know, your take on things to be, it is the same as mine. I, I always look at it as if this is just me living another life that's saying it. Like, I don't go, oh, that Duncan, like he thinks a bunch of stupid shit. Yeah. You know, I never think that. So when you give me a take on something, I respect it as much as if I was living your life and I came up with the information on my own. It's, it's, cool. a, it's a 100% sort of uh, 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 an appreciation for your thought process thing. And sometimes we think very differently. And one of, the one of the reasons why I love talking to you about a certain specific subject is sometimes I'll have one take on it and you'll have a similar but yet different take. Yeah. And it's, in it's always interesting to look at it from a, a completely different point of view, you know, uh, someone who's already constructed an idea on something and then you compare it to your own. So what I like about our conversations is it's like I get to think about things twice from two different angles. I get to hear your take on it and think about it from that angle and my take on it already, you know, so. Yeah. Because there's no right. I mean, there's so many fucking things that we we discuss, especially because you and I discuss the weirdest topics always. Yes. And the most strange, esoteric Instantly. Of ideas. Instantly. Usually in like two sentences. Yeah. We're totally like, <laughs> with two so it's like, it's not that you're right and I'm wrong. It's that there's a bunch of different possibilities and sure. takes on things. So it's cool to, you know, discuss something with you where you'll take it to a place that I wouldn't have. Or, and, you know, I'll take it to a place where, you know, and maybe you'll be like you know, the way the place I I took it. You'd be like, really? And I'm like, yeah, maybe, you know, this. and you're like, wow, I never thought of that. It's, it's having a bunch of friends like that. Like Ari's, Ari's very similar as well. Yeah. Ari's a brilliant guy. You know, Ari's a very smart dude as far as like deconstructing things going on around him. So when I talk to Ari, I feel like I'm talking to a guy who's, you know, I can trust his opinion. It's, it's a been a, it's a very formed opinion. It's yes. a, it's a clear, intelligent opinion with a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of thought and objectivity put into and it. And he's a really good listener. Yeah. And he's not a dumb dude at all. Ari can sit down and, and, and he can like, if, if I walked into a room and some shit happened, this guy got shot on the ground, I'd go, Ari, what happened? 
Right. He, he's like the first guy I'd go to. I'd go, yeah. what the fuck happened? And Ari would tell you exactly what happened as it happened. You know, He'd be I have, like, I shot the guy. Yeah, I, have, like, I love Brian Callen to death. Okay, yeah. but if I came into a room and I said, "Brian Callen, what happened?" He goes, "Dude, you wouldn't fucking believe this. <laughs> this guy, okay, first of all, Navy SEAL. First of all, okay, <laughs> just back from his fifth tour of duty. Okay, this guy gets in his face, and then ten minutes in the conversation, I, I go, "Hold on, were you there?" No, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Brian Callen, if sure. he walked in a second before me, he would tell me what happened in the most theatric yes. way possible. You yeah, know, if, sure. he had, if he had gotten to the scene of a crime a minute before me and I got there, he would be the expert on scene. <laughs> he would be able to break it down to me. <laughs> Whereas Ari would tell me exactly what happened in clear, yep. concise. That's a great way to describe him, man. That's exactly yeah. right. Ari, yeah, he doesn't exaggerate yeah. bo- shit to like no. make things more dramatic. Ever. I'll do that. I, dr- I exaggerate things. I, man, I do that and I don't even mean to do it. And then I'll listen to myself and be like, like I was talking about this. I can't really talk about it. You know what else Ari doesn't do? What? Never brags. Ever. Ever. Ari, I've never heard Ari brag once. He's one of the least self-congratulatory guys I've ever met in my life. Even when he first started tapping out people in jiu-jitsu, like a lot of people, like they, uh, they, you know, that becomes like a big milestone. Ari would just tell you, like, uh, matter of factly, like, like, like yeah. he was like, "Wow, it's getting really interesting." I, I started tapping people. Like, there's no bragging about it at all. Yeah. He's just completely relaying the way he's sure. deciphering this situation that's happening to him. Yeah, that's true, man. He's a he's a really like weirdly stable guy in certain ways. In certain yeah. ways, he's crazy. He's mad as a fucking hatter. Yeah, but he's getting better. He's getting better at everything. And he's getting better as a comic, which I think is giving him like a real sense of fulfillment. You know, now he's like headlining the improv in Addison, Texas. That's a big fucking room, man. That's an A room. You know, he's headlining Cap City in, in, in Austin. That's another A room. So that's two big Texas headliner gigs he's got coming up. Huge. He's going to crush too because he used to come out with me all the time. He always killed at those clubs. Those are wild people, man. He'll fucking tear it up out there. And so he's like a real professional comedian now. You know, he's like legit headliner national. And it's all podcast, man. It's all the internet. The internet has made Ari famous. People have been asking for him. People yeah. call clubs and ask for him. Yeah, that's you good. Know? They that, fill out their sheets. Who do I want to see? I want to see Ari Shafir. Where's that's Ari? such an amazing thing because it, it used to be if you were a comedian, the only way to get in that position would be getting on like the Tonight Show and uh, you'd have to like, or I guess tour around a bunch and kind of build up a following or something. A lot of guys did that, man. You know, I only had a couple places where I had a real following, but the, in those places, I, I have a big following in Houston, man. Houston was like the biggest following I had anywhere before anything, and it was before the internet. Yeah, I had a following in Houston in nineties in the in the in the late nineties. That's where I recorded my uh, first CD in ninety nine. Wow. In 99, yeah. And I, that's how, after I'd been coming there for years, and, uh, that, was, um, that was the old laugh stop in River Oaks. Oh, it was amazing. Hicks used to go there. Kinnison used to go there. That was, that was an incredible club, dude. Oh, my God. It just reeked of real comedy. Right. You know? And the, even the fucking open micers, man. You would go to the back in the day, like especially when the Laugh Stop was in full form. I understand that uh, John Wessling is doing something with it now. They're bringing it back. I think they call it the Comedy Union or something like that. I don't know. They're doing odd nights there, I think. I don't know what the exact information is about that. But that room is like the greatest comedy room in the history of comedy rooms there's like there's perfect rooms and then there's the laugh stop you get up there and you go oh shit perfect size stage perfect height perfect amount of people they could oh, stuff cool. 300 people in there but they're yeah. stuffed and they're rowdy texas people in houston god damn that was fun you know what that cool was about all texas crowds dude they're fucking smart yeah. and rowdy at the yep. same time. Yeah. It's this bizarre mix of like Especially really Houston hyper intelligent Austin. meets like yeah. strangely rowdy, but rowdy in a cool way. Yeah. They're fucking cool, man. Dallas too, man. A lot of really un- underappreciated smart people in Dallas, you know? It's uh, the the problem is Texas gets this weird rep because it's got like these re- three amazing cities, and there's a lot of weird parts. Kennedy of it. got killed there. There's a lot of weird parts of it. Yeah, George Bush the came from thing. there, and Kennedy got shot. Did you there. ever drive through that? No, I never did. I've driven through it. 
You want to come with me next time in Dallas? We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll film something there. <laughs> yeah, let's reenact it. F- film our own. Get the fuck out let's of here, video. Let's own- <laughs> <laughs> we'll just film it. Go get the fuck let's out of here. Re- That's what it, the video could be. Go get the fuck out of here. Me standing there, looking at the road, going get the fuck out of here, and you looking out the window, the depository, going get the fuck out of here. No, then- <laughs> I, I want to reenact the with the Death Squad. I want to reenact the entire Kennedy assassination yeah, according to. It. How it happened. That I'll would get a be convertible fun. Mustang. I'll rent a convertible Mustang. We'll yeah. do it. Yeah, that would be so fun. We have fucking sure. uh, 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 Joey Diaz can be Oswald. Dude, that could be tremendous. <laughs> what the fuck? What the fuck, cocksucker? <laughs> He's like, fuck you. I'm Jack Ruby, bitch. <laughs> yeah, he would be Jack Ruby, yeah, I he guess. Would be Jack <laughs> Ruby. How to do it for the mob. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that's the dumbest story ever, man. It's so funny how Well, I think he might have been involved somehow. I don't I don't know if uh he shot the president, but he might have been one of them. He might have been involved. I think they set him up though. I think that what Oliver Stone did, he did a bit of a disservice when he made that movie because I think his uh fictional recreation of it where he added a general that was supplying him information yeah. and there's there's so much that he did in that movie that sort of hurt the cause of the assassination because that's not necessary. The fucking facts are crazy enough, dude. The facts. How about the fact that all the, all the different people that were witnesses that wound up dead yeah. in violent crime yeah. and accident, car accidents, brake failure, cars exploding. Like a lot of people were murdered that sure. saw some shit there. I mean, that's, they did a, there's a, a book called best evidence and then they did a video. I watched it years and years ago. And one of the parts of the video was breaking down the, 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 the probability, of all these different people dying in you know some fucking horrible way, and it was like you know some some billion to one statistic that all these different people that had testified about happen. seeing the Kennedy assassination wound up getting killed. It's the funniest empire that we live in because people it functions like an empire. It functions as empires have always functioned. It does. It's not eat that special right. except for the fact that the population does not know they're in an empire. Well, they won't believe it. I mean, it's, it's really fascinating how the word conspiracy theory or the phrase rather has become this like really like instantly disarming you and it's yeah. like, Oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. Mm. Congratulations. Like the very least you are just socially, there's something fucked up about yeah. you. You're, you know, what are you doing? You weirdo. Oh, you know, right, here we go again. Yeah. And yeah, you know, it's it's like it's it's instant. It's instant. And but that's preposterous when you look at the conspiracies that are absolutely proven to have been attempted. When you look at the Gulf of Tonkin incident and you find out that that is mainstream just, news. Just, now. What is that? Explain that to me. The Gulf of Tonkin incident was a fake attack that took place that they they used as justification to go to war with Vietnam. Vietnam. They faked a whole thing. Mm. They pretended. I mean, and that's also what was going on with Operation Northwoods, which was a, a, pro, a, a proposal to fake a bunch of attacks by the Cubans so that we would go to war with Cuba. They you were going to blow up a fucking jetliner, the, like a, a remote control jetliner, which, we, hold on, but sorry. should make you think. Holy shit, they had a remote control jetliner in 1960. <laughs> it should make you think about that. What do they have now? Yeah, I didn't know that. Did you know that? No. No, no but they did. They, they had remote control jetliners in 1960 because that was part of the proposal. The proposal was they were going to fill a plane up with people, and then they were going to land those people, and then they were going to send a drone plane, another airplane, into orbit with no one in it. And these people, they were going to all have fake names, and they were all going to be assumed dead. Mm. They, I mean, they would literally would have been able to try to pull this off. This was signed by the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Sure. Happens all the time. They it's were going to arm the Cubans <clears throat> in Guantanamo Bay. They were going to arm the Cubans, Cuban friendlies, and force them to attack soldiers to start the war. Yep. This is like a real conspiracy. So when someone says, like, conspiracy theorist, um, yeah, you could say that. Or someone who likes hearing the truth. <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> yeah. like, I mean, it's, it's, there, yeah, there's a lot of them that are nutty, man. Well, it's the well, – I, 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 I look at certain people – in like like the in like uh, robbery movies, like jewelry robbery movies, where you trigger the tripwire and the steel door slams shut. Some people have that tripwire set up regarding this kind of stuff. So the minute you mentioned it, yeah. it to them, it's like a conditioning. Sure. The thing slams shut because it's like if you begin to accept the fact that you're right. you're in an empire, you're in an empire that transforms death into money it's called the military industrial complex and the way they make money is by killing people it's pure vampirism in the ultimate level they get paid to blow people up and that's 
evil. Always will be, always has been. Yeah. And that's fucking running the show. Yeah. So when you begin to realize like, oh, it's not just that though, it's also the prison industrial complex that yeah. has right now locked up in the dungeons alchemists, farmers, philosophers, <laughs> and people who just wanted to transform their life experience. That's it. Just people who just wanted to feel good. Or wanted to <clears throat> sell something so other people could transform their life yeah experience. that's it they're in the fucking dungeon they're in the brig right now as this podcast goes on they're getting raped because they felt like expanding their mind in a way that the government didn't want them to yeah. i was thinking about this dude imagine if in your house there were certain rooms that the government told you you couldn't go into like there were rooms in your house where like that's an elite don't go don't look in that room just don't look in that room don't go anywhere near that room and if you go into that room we have to take you out of your house and put you in jail well that's what the government's doing with psychedelics only the rooms are in your mind there are these specific rooms that you can go into and for some fucking reason the people making the bombs don't want us to go into the rooms that tell us we shouldn't blow people up anymore. That's bad. That's why it's illegal. So when when you when you begin to like start to accept the fact that you exist in an empire where there's a pharmacological prohibition that's intentionally being placed on the people to prevent them from realizing that war isn't good, that fighting strangers and foreign lands for money is an evil activity that should be immediately stopped if the population suddenly like came to that realization all at once then people would lose a lot of fucking money instantly yeah because we would th overthrow them well the people would lose a lot of money if we pulled people out of jails as well that's yeah. a, that's a reality that a lot of people aren't really even aware of the private privatization of our prisons has taken place a long time ago there's a lot of prisons a lot of them where people are actually turning a profit on on having prisoners there you know, every prisoner represents a, an extra bit of money a year yeah it's terrifying it's you, terrifying it's it's a, it's the matrix i mean it, the matrix was uh, a metaphor for this I mean, this really truly is that if someone's actually pulling energy out of these people's lives that's what the money is money is energy yes make a billion dollars buy a private jet this is what you're creating that's energy yeah. you know and you're you're making money out of these people being locked up in jail and Subsequently, supporting different legislation, different politicians that are going to support being tough on crime, in quotes, which includes the war on drugs so that you stay in business. Yep. I mean, it's, it's a bizarre, weird reality when you, when you, when you look at that. That's a, that's a bizarre, bizarre, weird reality that needs to be rectified. You can't have that reality in 2012 because then, then you're telling me that I'm some sort of a weird slave. Because I'm not, I'm not really a, a citizen of a, a, a diplomatic and democratic nation. I'm not. I'm not really. No. No, I'm sort of some sort of a weird wage slave that's trapped in this situation where these money constructing and creating corporations are in control of people's social behavior, in control of people's laws, how much they're uh, allowed to make, how much they owe. And it's really all essentially being taken care of by corporations. Corporations have moved people into position corporations or banks rather all really the same thing just big giant money entities what however they make the money whether they you know it, they're they're moving the world into a direction that benefits them the corporations they're not doing it for the citizens so we've gotten this weird sickness going on where something that we created has hijacked our welfare a corporation is just a construction that a human has created but all of a sudden it demands precedence over the actual humans itself and we're not even we're so sick and so confused and so not aware because of our lack of exposure to psychedelics because of our lack of exposure to anything that really takes away the ego, how that's not encouraged. Because of that, we're, we just go along with this corporation entity control thing, which is completely, uh, it's, it's, it's diametrically opposed to way, the, the way human beings should be running their time here on Earth. And it's being run by human beings. Yeah. Like, that's the craziest thing about it is the people that are at the very top of the ladder do not understand that they would be happier if they were selling 
things and moving things in a positive direction, paying people what they should be paid, more than not polluting the environment, making less profit, being more charitable, and doing it all clear and cool across the board. That a corporation doesn't have to be a negative influence, that it in fact can be like Google or like Apple and be a positive influence, not yeah. necessarily Apple, because I know Apple has that Foxconn thing going on. But I think the idea Yeah, but the they're working through it. I think they're working through yeah. it, man. It's a, they have good intentions. And it's possible that a corporation could only have the best intentions. It is possible that you could spread the ethic throughout all your employees that we're here to be good people and you could still make money. Yeah. You still make plenty of money. Make more money. You can make, it doesn't matter if it's more. You make enough. You make more than enough. Stop thinking about money. Let's yeah. do the right thing. Let's help everybody. Let's spread this this positive energy instead of just raping the fucking ecosystems of South American countries and, you know, going in yeah. there and offering them loans and then that they could never possibly pay back yeah. and then decide, well, don't worry about it. We'll just sell your oil from now on or we'll suck all the trees out of your forests. Yeah, man. You and, and, and what, what happens now is a bunch of people listening to this or, you know, somebody sitting at work or is like sitting like right now thinking, how the fuck do I what do I do? To help stop this from ha- to to change the course of our history and and make that happen. And you were talking about this cool idea you had, which I've kind of seen it here and there, which is that some kind of organization or some way to organize people to do super boycotts. What was it? You remember you were talking about that? Yeah. Well, I think you know you could easily figure out a way to connect. You look at this Coney 2012 campaign, for yeah. example. Fascinating story. Fascinating. The guy, he comes out, this Invisible Children Foundation. Turns out only a small percentage of the money actually goes towards this you know, this real situation. This guy takes a huge percentage of the money for himself and for his business and whatever. I think it's like 30 to 70%. So and then the guy makes insane amount of money in a very short period of time and then goes absolutely crazy and he's running around and he's he's naked in 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 San Diego and he's masturbating and here's the best part of it the guy is g- acting about as gay as is humanly possible yeah that he suppressed his all his flamboyance and his the crazy way that he really wants to express himself to really free him inside of him. Yeah. He suppressed it so perfectly and totally that whenever he was fucked up on whatever he was fucked up on, he probably looked at his PayPal account, saw a billion dollars, and just started fucking beating off with pounds <laughs> of meth. You know, just filling a fleshlight with meth and stuffing it in his ass and chewing on it while he's masturbating. I mean, he probably couldn't do enough meth. And then he just decided to just let the gay out. I got enough money. I'm going to let that gay out. I'm going to let it out. And so he was wandering around gay, naked, screaming, flailing his arms. His butt was puckered backwards. His back was arched. Yeah. His chest was sort of puffed out, but in a very effeminate and non-threatening way. Yeah. You know that, that this thing? Yeah, I know what it's you're talking about. It's not this thing where you're like scary, like, oh, this is yeah. a gorilla. He's going to come get me. No, it's this thing. Yeah. It's like this uber gay sexual thing. Yeah. Well. It's just my take on it. No, you know, I'll tell you my take on it, and it's far less picturesque and far less funny than your take. My take on the thing is, so what happened in that situation was you had a white blood cell, the white blood cell of the earth that was trying to like ostensibly fight some disease on the earth, right? But the white blood cell was a fake white blood cell. It was really not a white blood cell. It was a cancerous cell, and the earth just deactivated it. It was just like... <laughs> That's hilarious. It's like, oh, no, that sounds and the fucked method up. it used was crystal meth inside of a fleshlight. Yeah, you get him to fuck a fleshlight with That's crystal it. meth. The yeah. inside of his penis, the mucus lining and the memory wall, yeah. the open tissue is just ah. absorbing the meth right ah, there. It's just, crumbs and chunks are going into his cock. Oh, he's, he's got necrosis. His balls on it. are blackening. And his, it's, it's absorbing into the bloody gums. His, bo- his, his cock teeth. actually grew teeth and just started Starts eating the meth. The meth. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you have to smoke meth? Is it a reason? 
Can you eat it? Can I, you just eat meth? I, I'm sure. I don't. What I'm, if you eat meth and it's like takes you right to heaven? Nobody ever tried it. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody smoking meth completely fucks up your life. Like, but just, dude, have you ever eaten meth? Yeah. Trust me. Yeah, your you, IQ what if points you go eat, up. No, what if you eat meth and boom, you are in heaven. You're in the clouds. There's Literally. a fucking harp. Yeah. There's St. Peter. There's a book. It goes over your whole life. Yeah. Holy shit. What if that's when you eat meth? And you're in heaven. Yeah. And the <laughs> angels are like, why didn't you just eat meth? <laughs> that whole time like someone created meth like meth was a, a puzzle that was solved using the ingredients of cough syrups yeah. and aluminum cans and that's tires that's the secret and of the bible and fucking hairspray they're boiling it all up to make meth yeah. you, you eat that and you yeah. go right to heaven straight into the straight into the pearly gates Right Straight in. into you're, heaven. You're hanging out with St. Peter. You're like, oh my God, you're really wearing robes. Yeah. <laughs> We're really floating. We're not even walking. We're floating around. Those aren't crazy. clouds. That's meth smoke. It's just. Yeah. I wonder if, uh, by the way, before you enter into heaven, if you are walking around. I assume that you're up there. You, there's a line. You, yeah. There's a line. You're walking around. Have it's you like ever Disneyland. seen the Christian literature? No. It's so fucking funny. <laughs> Anytime they show the gates of heaven, there's inevitably a line. It's like six flags. You don't just oh. get in there. There's like, there's oh like, God, you so got to stand in there for, and it's, it's ineffective. And it's like businessmen. And it's totally ineffective. You'd think it's they'd like organize. Heaven is inefficient in the Christian mythology. They don't even have like the carousel things that like kind of make the line seem shorter. It's just this line going to a giant. Yeah. They always depict God as this giant and you, with an invisible face. And like, so I guess you go in front of the giant and he's like, nope. <laughs> Gary, go to hell. There was a, a historic, um, a history channel, or a, yeah, I believe it was a history channel, a documentary on religion, and they were referring to the Christian religion as the cult of Christianity. That's how they referred to it, like, it several times. But they were explaining the cult of Christianity, and I was like, wow, like you're uh, you're saying this on TV. It's, like this is yeah. a, this is an interesting take to 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 because there's a I've had that it's a dumb conversation but I've had it with a bunch of people that go it's not a cult it's a religion like what is the difference like what do you what do you, is the difference that it's older like what is the difference do you really believe that at the end of this line that there there really is some sort of a place that you go where you get judged by a guy and you really wait in line and there's he's got a book of everything you've ever done. Really? Really? You, it's it ad, as as advertised. So you know, gay guys. Well, fuck you. I don't care how you feel. Do that shit. You burn in hell. And if and if God does not like some aspect of your life, even though you were put on this earth with no fucking guidance whatsoever, Nothing. surrounded by child molesters and murderers yeah. and creeps and liars and politicians that are stuffing people into fucking metal machines and flying them over to another part of the world to blow people up. Yeah. And you're giving me a hard time because I beat off. Really? Yeah. And you're the God. You're the guy in control of this shit. And what I'm just supposed to know, or I'm supposed to what? I'm supposed to listen to these child molesters that you've set loose to to spread your word. Really, you <laughs> yeah, fuckhead. Yeah, right. That's the most ridiculous God of all time. Yeah. If that's how God really operates, I call that in God a literal I, sense. I call that God Loon Loon. That's the name I give to that God. Yeah. It's a loony, loony thing that's lost its mind and it doesn't make sense anymore. And its followers want the world to end. It's a it's a weird salute. Think of just think of like you're you're the creator of the universe you've populated a planet with people that you've been torturing for a few thousand years they're fucking up for some weird reason they're fucking up you're you can't tame them yeah. so your solution is well i've either got to kill all of them or i make i impregnate one of them by not fucking her and nail her son to a tree and then it We'll make everything better again. <laughs> <laughs> loon Loon! Yeah, I'll what? make sure that the people turn on him and he is not even allowed to use his magic to fight them off. No way. Won't even do any yeah. magic spells except for a couple of heals. I'm going to give him five heals and a water <laughs> and a wine. That's the only cards he gets. I went to the Passion of the Christ and immediately started talking about it on stage. I had to, of course. It was a ridiculous movie. S&M. And it was, yeah. It, what was amazing was how many people would get mad at me because... You know, this is when the Passion of the Christ came out. There was like a big reburst of Christianity. Like people were really moved by that movie. Yes. And what I said it was a it was a three hour movie about a dude with magic who got his ass kicked <laughs> and never used his magic. 
<laughs> that was the movie. It was like, what is so great about this movie? They're just beating the shit out of this dude. This is ridiculous. You don't even have a plot here. Yeah. Why am, is it really good for me to watch this guy, which, by the way, he isn't really getting beat up. This is a fucking, this yeah. is makeup and trickery and special effects. Yeah, this sure. is really diametrically opposed to what the beauty of the scripture was supposed to be about. Sure. Like any recreation of the scripture in, the, in a form that moves me so much that I'm visually seeing the Christ whipped and torn apart. What? How can you possibly be so audacious? That you think that you can? Is it audacious? It's audacious. audacious. Why does it sound wrong? It sounds audacious. audacious. It sounds wrong. It's audacious. Did I say audacious? You said audacious. I said it right. And then you said, "Is it audacious?" It seems like it should be wrong. Anyway, how preposterous is it that they think they could recreate that shit with CGI and that's cool with makeup and, yeah. and imagery? Like you don't know what the fuck really happened, and you're creating this. Sure. And you're you're putting this blasphemy out there. This Ridiculous interpretation of what you think happened, and it's just watching him get fucked up. If you really love Jesus, wouldn't you like to watch a three-hour movie about the cool shit he did? Yeah. Wouldn't you like, like, to, like to watch a three-hour movie about all the greatness and the yeah. way he inspired people that he's, if he was a real guy at all, is still being talked about to this day? Yeah. Instead, you a three-hour movie of a guy getting his ass kicked. It's a you, you missed the point entirely. Ridiculous. Well, no, they they didn't miss the point because the cult of Loon Loon is a <laughs> <laughs> it's a violent blood cult, and they they're into blood. The blood of the lamb was placed on Ooh. the earth, and they turn the the wine into blood, and they drink the blood, and the blood gives eternal life. They're really into blood. Well, dude, I don't think we can even wrap our heads around how much more fleeting life was. When the Bible was written, just just when it was written, forget about when it was told as an oral tradition, when people were essentially living like like some like nomads, you know, I mean, like what, what were we living like thousands yeah. and thousands of years ago? We were, you know, tribes, people and fucking living in these primitive, fucked up cities. Yeah. What kind of a shit bag life was life yeah, like back not then? Not a fun life. There's blood everywhere, man. Yeah. If you got cut, you bled to death. Yeah. Nobody knew how to stitch you well, up. Yeah. And you're fighting with swords. Good luck. Yeah. What the fuck kind of life is yeah. this? No penicillin. No so antibiotics. of course, everything was bloody and blood this yeah. and blood that. That's all they saw. Yeah. They, 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 what their Bible is not good enough for today. We know too much. We yeah. have too much information. We have a different tone of reality. You know, the, 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 the word of these men, as it represents, you know, supposedly the word of God, it's nonsense. It's craziness. Well, it's nonsense. It's lost in, in translation. At, at the literal level, yeah. it's nonsense. At the metaphysical level, at a symbolic level, when you look at, at it, there's a lot of awesome occult symbols that are encoded in the thing that you can apply to your life. But if you look at it from, literally, it's, re it's like really stupid. You can't look at it literally. There's a, there's a much much deeper meaning to to all that stuff that got lost you know like there were the Essenes and the Gnostics and there were people who are you know y y there's a lot of symbols encoded into that I was just oh, talking yeah. on the last one like um, on the last podcast I was just talking about this sorry to do a quick repeat but like so Christ gets crucified um, in between um, two robbers right one on his left hand and one on his right hand and so this can mean the robbers represent the past and the future and the cross itself represents t temporal time intersecting with infinity which is Whoa. the combination of um of, of what humans are we are the infinite we're the stardust mixing in with the impermanent and the cro the two things crossing create the phenomena of being a human so the representation of the crucifixion is the dreadful um, existential suffering that you will experience when you first encounter the truth that you're not, that this isn't permanent, that there's change. And that creates this kind of agonizing thing. And it's transcending that agonizing experience, being born again, rising again from the death that comes from uh, having that much contact with truth. And then you're fucking happy again. So that's, that's a, an interpretation of it that a lot of um that some like more esoteric christians are into you know water represents you know water represents uh doesn't represent literal water water represents um or wine represents truth and like there's all there's all kinds of each symbol That's in there means something and so but when you take it literally it becomes a bit of a, just a maudlin s&m show with this fucking hot skinny dude who's innocent getting the <laughs> ship shit whipped out of him by romans 
Dude, it's kind of cool. It's like this. It's like this. It's kind of cool. Son of a rich. It's like a rich kid. Yeah. It's like a, he's the ultimate version he's of a rich kid because his dad's kid. the source yeah. of all riches. He's got sent down here. He's too fucking cocky to use any magic, and he gets spanked for a couple of like for like oh, two days. He gets spanked for two days and gets his fo- and gets killed. That's what it looks like when you look at it literally. Loses wow. all its steam, dude. I, we're, I know we got to wrap up. I, 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 we missed – you didn't really – there was like a – my question is somebody – here's the thing we said prior to our evisceration of fundamentalist Christianity. They hear you talking about this idea of the um, the corporations infecting our culture and making us afraid and turning us into greedy bastards. What does like a person do – just a normal person out there listening. What do you? What's some actual actions that somebody could take to start getting out of the fucking autopilot, getting out of the sorrow? That's where a podcast is very critical, and that's where people with an open mind who are exposed to new ideas and new looking, new ways of looking at things, could possibly be the people that change things in the future. Because the people that are in power today are not going to be in power forever. And what we're essentially dealing with is a framework and a uh, a power structure that was devised before the Internet, which is a far better framework and a far better power structure. And it will ultimately inherit the way we govern things. I, I think you cannot stop it. I think this th- three-party system, whatever, if it's two and a libertarian, you know, if it's you know the Green Party and you had all all these other nonsense parties that have no shot at becoming the president, the internet will eventually be. It won't be. There won't be any parties. There won't be. There'd, there'd be ideas that people gravitate towards, and you would have to somehow or another show your education on these ideas before you're allowed to vote on them. And but no, still going to be. But I'm a dude right now, listening to this podcast, mm-hmm. sitting in my car, sitting in my house. I'm in a fucking shit relationship. You're changing. You're what ch- do I? No, not me. Uh, the person out I'm, there. I'm saying that person. They're changing. What, if they're oh, listening to this shit and they're absorbing. All the different ideas that we're putting out there and all the we, – we're expanding our own minds. When, when I have these conversations with you, I firmly believe that I uh, occasionally will pull ideas out of my ass and out of the air that I probably wouldn't have if you weren't here. They're like The, the like conversation – yeah, the, it adds something my on my side for to talk to you and and you know and we both have these weird tangents that we go down when we have these uh, these conversations and they're they're inspired by e- each other you know it's like it <clears throat> the, we, they fuel each other and it, it, for someone to to be able to listen to this some young kid who's in college or some you know some some dude who's uh you know starting his own business or someone who's at work right now who doesn't like what they're doing and wants to do something else it's like they have friends that are doing things correctly they have friends who are getting their shit together they have friends who are getting work done they have friends that are advancing and progressing and they have friends that are thinking a very specific way and one of the things they're thinking of the people are generous they're generous and they're friendly and they're nice the other thing is they're not afraid to be men you know all this bullshit that people have stuck in your face that the the construction of society where you know 90 percent of all men's actions are designed to not make a woman mad at you well that's nonsense this is, this is we're living this bitch bitch society this demasculated or emasculated rather society where you know a man can't be a man a woman can't be a woman you know everyone's judging everybody and it's nonsense and a lot of it is the same jealousy and stupidity that comes from people being afraid of other people's success it's the same thing it's just your inability to control a woman your inability to control your environment or to be a man and stand up for yourself and so because you you know you get accustomed to having sex with a woman all of a sudden you give in to her and and she's yelling at you and you take it well guess what bitch you fucked up the whole curve by you not being able to deal with that that chick's broken now you you know she breaks up with you when you guys are 27 28 and you guys have been together since high school well that's 10 years of being a cunt it's probably ingrained in her because you never you never figured out how to communicate with her tell her hey stop being a fucking cunt i'm standing my own ground here so you you made a broken woman you didn't. It's like a dog that you never trained properly. Oh no! no. It is as <laughs> as is the man. As is the man right. the, with the woman. I, I, the, look, behavior training someone in in a relationship. I don't mean that the woman's the dog. I mean that men and women, much like the way a, 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 a man and a dog or a woman and a dog interact, you establish boundaries and establish barriers and establish your value very early on. I'll tell you and something. It's not a negative I know thing or, or an animal thing or an objective it's thing. A, it's a, I, I, you don't I, let a woman push you around. I think and 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 I think that 
the reason that relationships get super fucking imbalanced Mm -hmm. is because certain guys, they end up becoming fixated on women because some guys some There's a bunch of variables but, it's but mostly what, insecure but what ends what ends up happening is anytime a woman or a guy for that matter becomes the main focus of your life and that's what you're always pushing towards then you're you've put yourself in a shitty situation and you've put that girl in a shitty situation you know maybe and not it all depends on how you get along together we're not whether or not you enhance each other the real problem is when you feel like you're distracting yourself with this person you're distracting yeah, that's what i mean man. you're you're forcing yourself to obsess on this person instead of deal with the fact that you've got a lot of fucking problems in the way you've structured your life that's it that's, that's what i'm talking about dude and that's and- part of, that's part of being a fucking man and that's that's real shit man and somewhere along the line it became stupid to be a man it became a meathead thing it became uh it, it, you know uh an egocentric dummy caveman thing to actually be a man that's nonsense that's stupid you can be a man and still be smart you dumb fuck this is ridiculous, but yeah. it's, it's the bottom line is you have two completely different animals that have to live together and breed. One wants this, and the other wants that. And guess what? If you want one to rule your life and, and, and dominate you, they're yeah. happy to do so. All they have to do is be able to push you around a little bit, and it's natural human nature. It's dumb men do it to women. Dumb women do it to men. Yeah. Unaware people do it to each other. People are constantly manipulating, pushing each other around. Yeah. And it, a lot of it is to distract them from their own shortcomings, their own bullshit. So have your own shit together first. Treat your own self like you care about yourself. Get to know your own self and respect your own self. And then you'll never allow a bullshit artist in your life. Praise you'll never, Allah. You'll never allow a person with You won't problems. invite a vampire in. You won't invite a vampire in. That's the most important aspect of your life. Keep away anyone that's going to detract. Bring around everyone is go- who's going to add and add with them. Add together. You know, you got to... Everybody's got to really embrace the idea that the more people that you have on your side, the more people you have thinking your way, the more people you have that are happy, the the stronger everyone's going to be. Everyone benefits together because, you know, you, you know, like if you could be assured that you could go someplace and everyone would be like, you know, like really open minded and cool and there's no psychos and no murderers and no, no, that's the first place everybody would go. Yeah. You would know that everybody would be super nice. Can you imagine if you could f- go to a place and there's a whole city and this city is filled with your best friends. Yeah. So instead of having five best friends, you've got a hundred thousand best friends. Yeah. That sounds preposterous to us, but why? If it's possible for five and it's possible for ten, I think it's possible for a hundred. And that's when things start getting squirrely. Yeah. And if we could all keep it together and keep one guy from wanting to be the alpha and go around and fuck everybody's wives, it can be done. I think you could have a whole community of best friends. I think it is possible. I think ultimately if we spread the right message and put the right information out there and attract the right people. That's sort of the inevitable direction that some aspect of our society is going to gravitate towards. Yep. That's it, man. That's everything you just said that you really did sum it up. And it's a, I think what you're talking about there, when you talk about the city of a hundred thousand friends, it's possible. You're talking about what, uh, the type, a type one civilization. Yeah. You're talking about the well, sort of, uh, you know, not technologically. I mean, we're, 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 we're but talking there's about more it. than the just technologically yeah. in that idea. The idea is it's like technology springs from a hundred thousand people working together. Imagine if a hundred thousand fucking people decided to work together on the same thing, whatever the thing was, just imagine a hundred thousand people decided, you know what? We're going to work on solar panels. That's what we're going to do. We're going to try to innovate a solar panel that's more, uh, that's the most powerful solar power panel ever invented so we don't have to live off of dinosaur juice anymore. Let's fucking make solar panels. And then you'd have solar panels. And now the solar panels would give us infinite energy. Now we have infinite energy. What do you guys want to work on next? How about a time machine? Anybody want to work on a time machine? Can we control the flow of time? Is that even possible? Well, now we've got 600,000 people because we've solved the energy problem. Now we have 600,000 best friends. Let's work on that. And the next thing you know... Yeah, but most of my best friends will be idiots. They won't be able to make a time machine. And if they do, I'm not hopping in that fucking thing. <laughs> you were high as fuck, dude. I saw you were high. You were drinking Mountain Dew and you made a time machine. Yeah, good luck, dude. I bet you send a basketball back in time first. I would never go in a time machine. If Red Band Red invented it, I'd never go in I'm pretty sure. Hold on. Did I get the right thing? Okay, I'm going to send a pack of smokes back first. 
No, you just end up at the first Olive Garden. It would only go. <laughs> <laughs> it would only go to the opening day of the first Olive Garden, and that would happen for infinity. Joe. Duncan, thank you so always much. Always a pleasure, my brother. You're always the fucking greatest. No, ever. you're the you're, you're the greatest. You know, um, it, like I said, you know, when you were uh, saying earlier that I'm a, a generous person, I'm a generous person because that, that's uh, that's sort of what everybody's supposed to be. You, no, no, it's no. possible. We can all we can all be generous. You're and, the podfather. And it does, does I'm not, and it does. Um, it's it's it helps everybody. That's why I always tell people like, if you can leave a big tip, and if you can go to a restaurant, and leave a big tip. That if you don't notice an extra twenty or forty dollars missing, you know, in your life, if you're if you're well off, and forty dollars doesn't mean shit to you, I guarantee you, an extra forty bucks means a fuckload yeah. to a waiter, and they get a bill like that, and they go, "Whoa!" Yep. You know, you you give somebody sixty dollars when you're supposed to give them twenty, and they're like, "What the fuck?" You know, like it makes them feel really good. Yeah. You know, and it's easy to do. It's forty bucks. It costs you forty bucks, and you 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 blew someone's mind. You just blasted someone with novelty, yeah. and you did it for forty. Some, you create a little happy, novelty a little happy burst. spark there. Yeah, a yeah. little happy burst. I love doing that, man. It's, and but pick, tipping big is one of my favorite pastimes. Make happy bursts, my sweet darlings. This week, set novelty fires in all the restaurants around you by over-tipping the waiters. Just do it and just see do what it. happens. Yeah, just be nice to people. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Be nice, be generous. It helps you. It really does. It aids you. It aids us. Do it. Do it for selfish reasons. Do it. Do it to to be a better person. Do it to improve yourself. Yeah. Because it really will. I mean, you can't really do it for selfish reasons because once you start doing it, you realize all oh, the joy is in com- being completely unselfish. And when someone comes out like a waiter who can't believe that you left him a hundred bucks and they come out and give you a big hug, like that 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 alone is that worth that is worth so much, man. That that is worth more than a hundred bucks. You know, yes, it is. It's what, yeah, man. You you know, if you if you buy a, a nice shirt and it costs a hundred bucks, you know that doesn't make you feel as good as uh, someone getting all excited. You don't even know what you what, what that hundred bucks did, man. That yeah. hundred bucks could have bought some fucking kid an awesome toy that's yeah. going to play yeah. with a toy. Sure. For, yeah. you, know, you just don't know what it's going to turn yeah, into. Exactly. But it's like yeah. it's good magic and fucking do it. Yeah, you can do things, man. You can you can give people what everybody else is giving them, and that's okay too. There's nothing wrong with giving them a generous amount, like twenty percent. That's a good. But I like over tipping. The reason why I like it is because the idea of tipping being, you know, it's up to you. It's up to you to decide. You know, so if it's up to me to decide and they're really cool, give them, tip them a hundred percent, you know, why not? Fuck it. I don't give a shit. And also it's nice. It feels good. You're putting out more than you're taking. And when you're putting out more than you're taking, you've created a a little act of magic because that's a beautiful fucking thing. Anything that puts out more than it takes in, that's a badass thing. If it's it's good stuff. It's a good system. Yeah. Well, I think that is the one thing that the podcast has really done. I think for everybody is, uh, we, we put out in in doing these podcasts and and doing them for free and putting a lot of thought and effort into it and and obviously making making people really aware that you care about their 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 love and you you care about all the nice things that people have been saying and that you really appreciate it and and how cool it is to have such a bunch of nice people come out to all our shows and you you put that out and then you you put it out with this free thing for so long and you really do like accumulate all this goodwill like it makes people feel better at work it makes people feel better at the gym and all that stuff is like it helps you too it helps the person who created it because you get this great satisfaction out of that and that satisfaction is a super positive feeling that you're making all these people entertained and you're, you're providing all these people with fascinating conversations and that that just builds up and it just keeps like the podcast is a, a pr- proof of it. We've never advertised that thing anywhere. Yeah. We've done no promotion whatsoever. <laughs> I've never done anything. I've never done anything where I did a, a like I went and you know paid for something or you know or went on something to promote it. Never. It just it built itself up over the internet. But through word of mouth, now it's around half a million people every episode. That's crazy. Yeah, that's but, insane. But it's because of what we're putting out there, you know, and that's what's what it's making me better at doing it. It makes me better at being a podcaster. It makes me better at being a stand up. I think I think my stand up is better than it's ever been. Well, know? dude, I've got I've got books now all around my house that have been suggested by people who are listening to the podcast, yeah. which I actually read. And then I bring that information 
back into the podcast. So it's definitely creating an information feedback for loop sure. for me. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's um, we're super lucky, man. We we stumbled upon this thing like every other thing in my life ever <laughs> at the exact right time. <laughs> yeah, I've, uh, uh, I've 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 been the luckiest person I've ever met. I've stumbled on the right thing every single time. It's strange how that yeah. happens, huh? It's bizarre. Yeah. It doesn't seem to make sense. It's one of the more uh, compelling arguments to the idea that life is a piece of fiction, you know, along with uh, this fucking Coney guy whipping his dick out sure. and masturbating in the street. I mean, it that, it was, that was on a sitcom. It would be too over the top. No. It would be like smash cut to he's naked, run around masturbating, yeah. <laughs> exploding clown shoes and fucking yeah. confetti coming out of his nose. Yeah. I mean, come on, man. It was, it's too over the top. But yet that is reality. And my my own my whole life like everything that i've ever done everything you know it's all feels like a work of fiction i'm telling you man we're just a few fucking years away from one something of those things crazy. happening <laughs> it's gonna be something <laughs> well, i think a million times crazier than that you were the first person to tell me uh when we lived uh together and this is before i ever even did the podcast yeah uh when uh, you were staying with me for a few months we had some weird conversations you know we had some like really deep like late night that. crazy conversations <clears throat> and and one of them was <laughs> you were way too high for this but uh you know i collect all this crazy eastern art i have all these buddhas around my house yeah. and all these um uh what is that fucking crazy bird like character Oh, Garuda. Oh, Garuda. Garuda and Ganesh. And I'm, I'm, you got a Shiva. Yeah, I'm completely fascinated by I have a giant Shiva. It's bronze. It weighs yeah. like a thousand pounds. Um, I'm completely fascinated by ancient religions and the imagery because I've seen that imagery during psychedelic trips. I've seen the Garuda. I've seen very similar things yes. inside psychedelic trips. And uh, we were we were just sitting around my house, and you were like, "Dude, there's a reason why you're drawn to all this stuff." Sure. You were really freaking me out. You're like, "Dude, there's a reason why you're drawn to all this imagery, man." He goes, "This imagery is like resonating exactly what's going on in your head." Yeah. You know, it doesn't. You don't have to know Buddhism. You don't have to know the Tibet. He goes, "You're drawn to all this stuff. This stuff's going on in your head." And you're, and you were like, and a lot of your ideas that you've come up with independently are very similar to a lot of ideas that exist in Buddhism. Yeah. And we were both super fucking baked. And I was like, dude, this is a, this is a crazy conversation. Yeah. Can you imagine if all that, all those weird, bizarre, beautiful images of golden buddhas and all these things that you can see when you trip and the the reason is because that's where they all come from they're all pulled out of this weird sort of a psychedelic state and brought and the, these are just representations but really accurate representations of the actual you know psychedelic element that exists when when you when you're 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 taking things yeah it's the yeah that it's reality it's actually reality what yeah. you're seeing is reality and man i'll tell you I still believe that shit. You also have Buddha tattooed on your arm, but <laughs> but uh, but um, uh, yeah. For in the east or in the west, that I the the idea that you have incarnated again, you were probably some kind of Buddhist monk, or you that's, were like about to. Abandon. That's ridiculous. Hold on, let that's, me just tell the story. I that's tell some what, Steven Seagal I'm gonna, shit. I'm tell what happened to you? Okay. You were this Buddhist monk. You were about to get enlightened, and you probably just like started fucking some girl or something you got distracted you were almost <laughs> there but like some hot girl came by and you you ended up so yeah these are you know it's just symbol systems to try to um to try to like uh, control the infinite variables that surround us all those ideas like a past life or this and that but after i had the podcast that i'm gonna put out tomorrow with this guy ragu marcus who met that guy the guy on my wall there um that's uh neem Carly baba and this guy when i met him and he was just a totally normal guy no pretend no he wasn't putting on airs totally normal guy he talked about this stuff in a way that was like it isn't just a psychedelic state man it's real it happens people can completely dissolve their ego and their personality and merge into a supreme consciousness experiencing pure awakening and enlightenment and then anytime you get around that person your life gets changed forever because they've be become like a fucking um 
portal through which infinity's blowing and the experience of that coming through a person reconfigures you forever. So they, in the things that this guy talks about and the stuff that many, many people have seen and experienced and also just being around that guy when he left, I felt high as a fucking kite and I didn't get high. Wow. It makes me think that, um, it makes me think that there's a more to it than, than a lot of people would be willing to accept. And if you were to go to India and talk to people, they're like, Oh yeah, yeah. You're definitely re- you were you were you were reincarnated and you're fucking the deepest part of yourself is trying to get to remind you of this stuff and the way it's coming out is you're like man I really love Buddha statues boy do I love statues of Shiva the god of destruction I just love <laughs> statues of the god of this I love the statues of Shiva I just love Buddha statues and Shiva sta- you know what I, it's just a cool image I'm just gonna tattoo it on my arm permanently. <laughs> That's a way of looking at it. It could also be that I think all those images are cool artwork. I love that artwork. I love like uh, I have those crazy big dogs. What are those things called? I don't know. I forget what they're called. Uh, but they're these crazy. I th- I think they're from Indonesia, and they're these really nutty. They look like dragons, but they're actually some sort of a dog. Have you ever read a book on Buddhism? Yes. Yeah. I'm gonna give you a really good one, man. Okay. I'm gonna give you a really good one that's really that you'll love. It's really simple. But what I was saying is that I'm really fascinated by the imagery. Sure. I mean, there's the ideas. There there have been a lot of ideas that I had that I came up with independently that I didn't know that were like, you know, sort of essential parts of Buddhism. But lo- along the way, I think what what really was always compelled me was the visuals. It's it's really I'm I'm fascinated by just the look of the Buddha. Like, I'm drawn to it, man, especially that one that I have in my living room. Yeah. There was no option of whether or not I was going to buy that. All I was thinking of is how are you, can you deliver this to my house? Right. Okay, how do I get it in my house? It was a stupid, expensive thing. It's this giant golden Buddha with little mirrors all over his body. It's fucking beautiful, man. And in my house, when the sun comes in and hits it perfectly, I just stare at it. I stare at it for sometimes five, ten minutes. And I don't know why, but I'm, I'm fascinated by all that ancient artwork, all the, the Garudas and the Ganesha and the Shiva and, and Buddha. And I, I look at all these things and it's, it, it resonates with me in some sort of a, a, a weird way. Like, I want to know what the fuck the inspiration of these images really was. Yeah. I want to know if that's, is that, is that Soma? Did they did they tap out of that stuff and then lose it and fi- can't figure out what the fuck the formula was? Yeah. Did some civilization fall apart and they you know they lost Soma and Soma was greater than everything. That was what they would always say in the text. Yeah. Soma is greater than Brahma, greater than Crazy. Indra. Yeah. yeah, that Soma was the greatest concoct yeah. and widely recognized as a psychedelic compound that we don't know. We don't well, know what it was. The thing with Buddhism, though, is that that, um, th- that happened after Soma. It was a little while after because b- b- Siddhartha was a, would have been a Brahmin. He would have been a Brahmin. What happened after Soma? I think that I'm not positive about this, but I think during the time that Siddhartha Gautama, Buddha, was walking around. I th- I don't know that there. I think this was even this was past the time when what you're talking that about, they had already lost Soma. I think so, but I, I don't mm. know. So because because this is a the um the but but he was probably getting fucking baked because he went um and uh, before he like gained enlightenment he was hanging out with the ascetics and the sadhus and they all get fucking high as a fucking kite man oh, yeah. they they smoke chillums and it's always and that's interesting that that's sort of a neglected aspect of that culture you know when 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 people talk about buddhism they really don't give enough credit to the fact that he was being heavily influenced by people who were taking some serious fucking cannabinoids man smoking hash yep. and you know, really, really deep trips. He spent a long time eating a lot of it. With those yeah. people. Yeah. And, 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 um, who, yeah, who the fuck knows? I, we don't, I don't who know. Knows? They don't know what the fuck Soma was, which is yeah. so incredible. When you think of the impact that it had on their culture and that there's, you know, it's so lauded in, in the, in the literature that's, it, it's, it's just praised as being this incredible, incredible, like elixir of life. And no one knows what the fuck it is. They lost it. 
I mean, I always just, I just always think it's, <clears throat> it's like some cannabis. It's just eating. I mean, I know. Why that would seems... you think that? Why would you think that? There's been scholarly work on it. I know. It, I know. Where they, they believe it's mixture. a concoction of Amanita muscaria, psilocybin, and then there's some some other ideas that it was a concoction of a bunch of other things like lotus flower and a bunch of different other psychoactive substances. I right. forget there was like a, there's lotus. actually a really recent one. I wish I could remember what the combination was, but a really recent one where I read online where they were uh, they they believed they had a possible combination of what soma could have been, but it's all speculative. Well, one thing that isn't speculative though is that people at that time were getting super high fucking high as and fuck. meditating and using it as a as ritual. Om, om, om. <laughs> Yeah, that if you haven't heard it, folks, go and watch the Lotus Sutra. Watch it on YouTube or listen to it on YouTube. We'll, we'll put a link on the comment section of this. Why don't um, you just add it to the end? What's that? Just add the audio to the end. Uh, there you go. I can do go. that, too. Yeah, That's going to go at the end? Yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. Joe. Duncan. You're beautiful. You're God beautiful. You. I am inviting you. you, since you're my favorite podcast guest of all time, next week will be our 200th podcast. And I was going to do it solo, which is me, uh, with me and Brian. That's so we, we did 100. Yeah. But I, I think to mix it up, I'm going to bring in you. You want to do it? Shut the fuck up. Oh, you're yes. going to bring me? I wasn't going to mention it, but I saw yes. people being like, who will be the 200th? It's going to be you, 200? buddy. No, I'm not doing it. Yeah, you have no, to. No, of course I'm going to do it. That's <laughs> fucking awesome, dude. <laughs> Yeah, I'll be there. Uh, we can't believe we're hitting t the number two hundred. You know, and your your conversations in the, on the podcast are my favorite. We we you bring some weird shit out of me, dude. I'm you not, bring yeah. weird shit out of me, man. It's yeah, such we both a do. It's, it's awesome. It's a, it's a cool relationship, you know. And it, like I said, you know, when you're saying that I was generous, I benefit. You know, it's I'm uh, I benefit from all of this. I benefit from all of our friendships. I benefit from Joey. I benefit from Brian. I yeah. benefit from you and Ari. I, I benefit from everybody. I think we all do. We benefit from each we other. We do benefit from each other. You're being. You're still. I there's like a reason why. I'm, there's a reason why um, all these great things happen to me. Yeah. And I think uh, there's a lot of what it is is work. It's for focus and all that good stuff. But it's also how much good shit you put out. So it's like the more good things you do for other people, the more good things happen to you. I, th I really, yes. it sounds it sounds like hippie no. nonsense, no, it voodoo bullshit. It's not voodoo, brother. We're in an yeah. echo. It's an echo chamber. It's an it's a crazy echo chamber that we're in right now. And yeah. If you blast out the positivity, it comes. And I'm not perfect, and no one is. You know, I'm I I you know I lose my my temper just like everybody else does. Sure. I just try to keep it, it as, as I just try to keep it to as high a frequency as I can maintain. And sometimes I'll lose it and then I got to get back on it. But the majority of the time, my frequency is very, very high. And I am trying to always do what I think the hero in the movie would do and always do what the person who would be, you know, if I was going to give myself advice, do that, do that, pretend, right. pretend, give yourself advice. If you yeah. were outside of yourself and you're like, well, here's what you probably don't want to hear, but this is what you're going to have to do, you know, look, and look at it that way. Yeah. You know, I think we could all do that, man. We can all, we can all make people feel better. We can all enjoy, enjoy our time or we can all go after what we really want to go after, do what we really want to do. You know, people think they can't do that. And I, I, I don't, I can't fix you. I can't, I can't, I can't reach out to someone who has no desire, but I, I know that there's things that I can say that can resonate with people who do have an inkling in, in their mind and in their, in their body and their being that they're not reaching their full potential, that they're not happy, that they're not, that somehow or another, their version of life differs from everybody's around them and they feel crazy, but they're not crazy, man. They're not crazy. The, the idea that most people are fucking out of their mind, that's too preposterous for most folks. So it's too, it's too precocious. The idea that you're going to say that you could figure it out, but the, you know, the majority of the population population can it sounds ridiculous until you recognize it to be true and then you go oh fuck yeah oh well this this is nuts while well, half the world is paying attention to the size of kim kardashian's ass and a, yeah. a fake election that's going on right before our eyes yes. where regularly they're they're calling out voter fraud there was a big thing in missouri yep. they know they robbed ron paul in maine clear as day yep. it's all been proven where we we live in a a mad, mad film. That's what we live it's in. It's a mad fucking film, man. But if you stop getting caught up in all the crazy illusion and uh, magic tricks happening around you and just start trying to evolve yourself, 
Clean the fucking apartment, man. Yeah, clean man. Clean your apartment. That clean helps. Clean your car. Just take little basic steps. Stop worrying about the fucking Kim trails. Yeah. If you smoke, especially. Oh, my God. That <laughs> freaks me out. I have friends that go wacky. Eddie Bravo's wacky for the Kim trails. Wacky. Yeah, it's like you get you. Like, I don't know, man. You have all these people worried about fucking chemtrails. I feel fine. <laughs> yeah, I feel fine, too. No one's programming me, bitch. First, okay, before you worry about doing? the chemtrails, start exercising. Yeah, I don't know. what well, You can't say that about Eddie. But I, I don't oh, know true. if chem... <laughs> he's he's like jiu-jitsu, master. jiu-jitsu master. <laughs> Maybe he's right. <laughs> yeah, maybe he's right. Maybe chemtrails are real, man. <laughs> well, he's also into UFOs. And I've been into Bigfoot lately. It's the, the bane of my existence. Mitch Hedberg, greatest joke of all time yeah. about Bigfoot. Maybe Bigfoot's just blurry. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a show called Finding Bigfoot. It's the dumbest fucking show, and I cannot stop watching it. Have you ever heard of Psychic Sasquatch? No! Sasquatch. What? Is, is that a Tim and Eric sketch? No, it, it sounds like it would be. Like it sketch. sounds like a total Tim and Eric sketch. <laughs> Psychic Sasquatch yeah, sounds psychic like Sasquatch. That would be a South Park episode. It's a book, but the idea is that, that Sasquatch is super intelligent. There's a bunch of them, and they're invisible to mm. people who don't believe in them. That sounds like a crock of shit. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> sure is. But these guys are awesome. These fucking finding Bigfoot guys—they're so awesome. It's such a dumb show. They want it. It's like there's no objectivity whatsoever. They like they look at these videos. Someone shows them a video. Yeah. They look at the video. The video is so obviously the guy's wearing blue jeans, man. Yeah. I'm looking at his fucking. It's blurry, but I'm pretty sure I see blue down low and dark up top. And he's not even that big. And so and then they have another guy come by. He's their friend. This guy Bobo. He's really big. He's like six foot four. And so Bobo gets in the background and stays in the exact same spot where they had the sighting. They recreate the sighting, yeah. and you see that Bobo is much bigger. So they're like, damn, well, we don't believe the video is real, but this is a very squatchy area. Everything is squatchy, squatchy. They'll talk about like, there's, this is real squatchy country. This is where Sasquatch would live. So they go out there, and every fucking episode is the same thing. Yeah. They go out there, they're there really late at night, and they yell, yeah, yell. They do a Sasquatch howl. And they're like, oh, no. They'll have like walkie-talkies, and two of them will go one way, and the other two will go the other way, and they're looking at them with night vision. They're like, all right, I'm about to let out a call. And so 2.30 a.m. in the woods. <laughs> so they yell out the Squatch call. Anything? What was that noise? Do you hear that? Do you hear that? And you hear a coyote in the background. I think we think it's just a coyote, but this is really Squatchy country. So, the, so we're going we're gonna to stick it out. <laughs> So they go, they go and wander around. And one time they shot off fireworks. They're like, well, one of the ways to get Bigfoots to really respond is to light explosives in their neighborhood. <laughs> so they fucking, they fucking find this spot and shoot these bottle rockets and shit up in the sky, scaring the fuck out of any potential Bigfoot. I would give anything to have seen the pitch for that show. But meanwhile, I know that they're not going to find shit. But meanwhile, I'm watching it every goddamn week. I have a DVR. I can't stop watching Finding Bigfoot. It's it's a fucking amazing fascination that <laughs> well, I have. It sounds entertaining. Dude, I can't stop watching it. I'm, I've watched every one of them so far. It's so stupid. It's Every week, it's the same goddamn show. Every week as well. The video doesn't reel, but this is really squatchy country. And they Dude. just go... <laughs> Anywhere there's a tree is a squatchy, squatchy, squatchy area. I can feel it. I, I want to talk them into having a show in Los Angeles and maybe getting one of our comic friends to call them up and say they're pretty sure that Bigfoot is in Burbank. <laughs> they like, have like these areas, yeah. like, wooded areas, where a squatch moving at night could go from spot to spot. Dude, that fucking L.A. River, brother. Could have you, you ever been down to the L.A. River? You, it made a video of a, a squatch in the L.A. River. And then sent it to these guys, and then you know they they're like, well, it that's, doesn't. That's a homeless guy jerking off. It might not. It might be a squatch. Yeah, 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 it could be a squatch. Could be a squatch. <laughs> and they're gonna you know decipher it and decode it, and then go looking for squatches late at night in L.A. <laughs> 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 Could you imagine if they were setting up a fucking uh, 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 squatch thing and you hear sirens going off? Well, sirens do attract squatches. Oh, like, yeah. Hiding in the park and shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's how preposterous that show is. There's, they could look in an attic. Go look in an attic. You might find Bigfoot there. That's where you're looking. Yeah. You're, you're looking in the dark. Ah! You know, go, go, look, go look in someone's basement. 
Well, yeah, it's a it's a mythical creature. They're looking. You might they might as well be looking for a unicorn or, or looking for a talking pelican. It might be real. It might have been real at one point in time, at least. Two hundred fifty different names for the North American Indians. That's sure. crazy. Yeah. Dude, I feel like we just went back in time again. This is fucking Fuck, nuts, why man. Does this keep happening, we man? have been abducted by aliens a second time during one podcast. Where That's do we crazy. Go? Why? Where do we go? Well, obviously we're special. We have to figure <laughs> out what our message is and why they're choosing us because we are being chosen. Chosen. Okay. Rogan, thank you. Russell, thank you. I love you. I love you too, buddy. Joe Rogan, everyone. Yay. Hare Krishna. God is love. Keep the pussies wet. Be friends. Hello. <laughs>